Please take the seats. Ready, Sarah? Okay. <clears throat> Joining us this evening on pianos, Ms. Jane Howard, please rise for the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. Any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Any new members? Seeing none. Um, Steve, I want to announce to, that our our representative, Sean Garvely, has introduced a bill um, and has had today proclaimed um, Massachusetts Hearing Loss Awareness Day. And in conjunction with that, he's attempting to have uh, the legislature pass public access to hearing aids for children. And he wanted us to all know that this is something he's doing and that it's a worthy cause and we should encourage him and our other representatives to do it. Basically, it would aim to provide insurance coverage for, for children under 21 so they can get hearing aids if they don't already have them. So call up your other representatives and give them a, um, uh, a boost for Sean. I don't have any other remarks today, so let's see. Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Ms. Rowe. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meetings as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, to Wednesday, May 18th, 2011, at 8 o'clock. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So, so moved. Um, any announcements or resolutions? Mr. Howard. <coughs> As a member of uh, Peter Howard Precinct 10, thank you, Mr. Moderator. As a uh, member of the Recycling Committee, I did not hand out a resolution that we're planning to present with Article 34 uh, when uh, Selectman Rowe takes it off the table and she's planning to do uh, on June 8th. <clears throat> but it is in the back of the room in a stack and I urge you all to take a copy of it and uh, think about it uh, uh, positively. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Mr. Marr. John Marr, Precinct 14. Uh, I serve on the Sims Program Fund Committee, which administers about a million dollars, uh, uh, which is leftover funds uh, after a split with uh, Lay Clinic, which provides a, a medical services for the greater Arlington community. Please note if anybody's interested in making an application for these funds. The next round of fund uh, request proposals are being received. 
Uh, there is a notice that last uh, Thursday's advocate, and if anybody has any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Seeing none. Um, there are some reports of committees this evening. Mr. Tosti, can you take three off the table? Move that Article 3 be taken from the table. Second. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? Okay. Any reports of committees? Okay. We're going to do them in a specific order. Mr. McKinney's going to go first, then the school committee. Mr. Gilligan, you have a report as well? Okay. So maybe we'll take you before the school committee. Mr. McKinney. Mr. Trembley has one. Mr. Cole. Yeah. Mr. Cole, I see you, Mr. Cole. This is Anna. Lawrence McKinney, Precinct 7. Hello? Is this working? Jane Howard, yeah. Like that? Hello. Okay. Lawrence McKinney, uh, Precinct 7, Chairman of the Uncle Sam Committee. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody in this hall for supporting us last year. We were able to go out and uh, find our logo and uh, get the whole thing together. And I was going to make a facetious display of the $300 we have left before I was appointed financial director of the entire town. But that's for something entirely different. Today we're going to celebrate Uncle Sam and the return of the spirit of tourism. Um, first our accomplishments. We want to welcome Hugh McCrory, stand up Hugh, very, very hard worker, and we want to send a vote of thanks to Janice, who is the last, Janice Weber, who was the last member of the old Uncle Sam committee and has transcended to <laughs> Stephanie's job. Thank you so much, Janice. We have uh, done our bit to try to increase the uh, promotion of Uncle Sam. Uh, we've been in the uh, Arlington Advocate three times. We've been in the Boston Globe at least once. And thanks to Sean Harrington, is Sean here today? Uh, he managed to tell the world that Uncle Sam was born in Arlington and thus managed to reach two million people in 30 seconds. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> we are continuing work with Sean Garbley also to try to get a Uncle Sam Day for the Commonwealth. Okay. One of the things which we asked for last year was that we would go forward and see if we could get a better logo to how to explain the connection of Uncle Sam to Arlington. We held a contest. Some of the designs were better. Some of the designs were not quite so good, but we finally came upon a winner. Uh, we have some in the back. In fact, we have many in the back, and we hope that each of you can take home a small dividend for your support, and thank you very much again. We're not going to ask you to wave them in the air or anything. Okay, now comes to something a little bit more serious. One of the things about Arlington is we have a lot of history, but most of the world doesn't know about it because their trust aren't big Jake and Jason Russell uh, groups or Dallin Museum groups that have a lot of money. The only person we have in this town that everybody knows about, unfortunately, is Uncle Sam. The very fact that he's perhaps 95% cartoon character gives us a tremendous flexibility with what we can do with this gentleman. But the fact is, is he's there, we own him, and we should publicize him. Now, as you probably know, there's going to be a massive uh, federal project called the uh, Scenic Byway Battle Road, which will include federal funding for advertising, for transportation, and for, uh, and for land management. And um, this, uh, it's, a, it's a huge tourism. It, it follows Massachusetts Avenue running right through Arlington. We attended every meeting uh, after January of 2009, and we were the only independent town committee that actually sent people to these meetings over and over again. Our town had twice the representation, you might say, but tourism-wise, we need it. Now, one of the things you'll notice in the next slide is that this is from the actual study. Everything goes right through Arlington, and it goes right through Arlington at that spot. Broadway comes through. Mass Ave comes through. Pleasant Street comes through. The bike path comes through. It is a totally natural focal point for people coming through Arlington. 
So we had a problem here because although we had a lot of people coming through Arlington, we really didn't have what amounted to a tourist attraction. Now, um, everyone comes by here, but uh, no one really um, seems to know about it too much. And we don't have any place to send tourists to other things. We don't have a sort of a signboard. So uh, we got thinking about it, and we went to see what Lexington was doing. Well, they had a big, beautiful statue up there. They had lights on the statue. You can't see Uncle Sam at night. He's completely gone. Um, they have a big signboard up to show people where other tourist things are, and we don't have that. And we were not even going to be noted as a tourist place in the program. We had to work very hard. The reason is pretty simple, if you can see that picture, uh, we don't have any signage. The bike path has huge signs, but there's nothing for Uncle Sam. Uh, there's no information. It's completely obliterated. You can't read anything, and it takes a person with a very good mind to figure out what that thing to the left-hand side of Sam is. There's no lighting, and the landscaping certainly doesn't look like anything but my lawn. So we had to figure out what can we do. The big thing is to get information. So um, I attended five of the first six meetings of the Byway Tourism and Economic Development Committee where I learned about how such things are done. Since I was an invited member, I, I didn't have to, you know, wait my turn to say things and so on, which is probably why I wasn't a member. But I want to thank all of the people who ran that committee for the tremendous amount of help we got from them. I want to thank Clarissa for putting the whole thing together. Carol for explaining to us exactly what Larry Koff was trying to do in his economic development survey. Joey, uh, Joey Glushko, Glushko came by to talk about how signage problems were popping up and we were able to get behind that. And uh, Howard Winkler has been working for a long time with Jason Russell House and of course Bob Bowes is a very sagacious and wise guy. What we learned is that the statue just happens to be in the center of an area singled out for development and we're working to improve that area. So. We started talking. We talked to uh, Mike Rodemaker, and he said, you know, we could get lights there. We do have a thing to make better lights. And we talked to uh, some people who knew what was going on, and they said, that's not hard. We've got a space there that we're not using at all. So uh, we thought to ourselves, hey, why don't we use this to draw the tourists in? Why not pave it? Imagine the brick plaza, landscaping, flat bricks, uh, landscape, but real signage, a tourist information board, good lighting, create that focus for anyone biking or walking or driving past this town, a low-cost tourism hub. This is what we propose, the Uncle Sam Wilson Plaza. Economic feasibility? Well, 212 happens to be the, be the 200th anniversary of Uncle Sam. He popped up in, in um, 1812, so we can do that. And 212 is also when this byway is supposed to open. Now, major businesses will probably be very happy to get on the bronze plaque. I know what they cost. They're less than you think. But this will be there forever. And small businesses will also be interested. We've even counted the bricks. If we sold a brick for 10 bucks, we'd have $70,000. As it is, we could get this thing done for the cost of 10 Xerox machines. Um, that's about 30000 uh, We have until September 13th to 12th, and it's really not that expensive, and people are already start stepping up to help us out. The people who were tending the mulch have already said they'd be glad to help, help Mike. Um, Mike, are you there? Yeah. Mike, he's already volunteered to help. We've got people already standing up to help get this together. So, it's time to start being tourism. You have on your laps the actual words. And all you have to do is sing do da. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> Sam Wilson came from Arlington. Do da, do da. He's our famous native son. Oh, do da day. Uncle Sam's his name. He's bound to bring us fame. He packed his pork in Troy, New York, but he came from Arlington. <laughs> Sam got up early on that morn, do da, do da, that the USA was born, ho, oh, the do da day. He saw the troops march by, he saw men fight and die. He packed his pork in Troy, New York, but he came from Arlington. Okay. 
1912, he brought relief, doo-dah, doo-dah, to hungry soldiers with his beef. Oh, the doo-dah day, they loved his potted ham, they called him Uncle Sam. He packed his pork in Troy, New York, but he came from Arlington. The U.S. stamped on those supplies, do da do da meant Uncle Sam, they all surmised, oh, the do da day. So the legend grew till everybody knew he packed his pork in Troy, New York, but he came from Arlington. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And now to more important matters. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. <laughs> Ms. Howard? That's a big act to follow. very tough act to follow. <laughs> Jane Howard, Precinct 10, co-chair of Vision 2020. And I'm very pleased to present tonight the annual Vision 2020 report to the town meeting. Uh, in the back of the hall, again, in a box, are these little booklets which uh, summarize the report. And they will be, this information will be available on the town website tomorrow. Perhaps some of you have seen an earlier report of the survey, but this is what we're required to do each year. So our report comes in three sections. The first is in the community development section of the town's annual report. And that one contains our activities of the year and last year's survey. The second is included in Article 65, funding the water bodies and the recommended vote of the Finance Committee be, will be what we consider. And the third is the summary of this survey that you all received in your homes uh, this January, or late January, and we counted the responses for six weeks. And so uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about those. This year we called this survey uh, Truth and Consequences. You can inf influence the difficult decisions. We have a little PowerPoint to go along with this, so you, you can probably look at your books later or ask questions of us. I'm very grateful to Josh Lobel and Joey Glishko for helping us put this together and all the people who worked on the survey and indeed all the people who responded. So we received 4,073 surveys by March 15th. And it's the second year that we've had uh, more than 4,000 responses. This is 21%, not the 21, 20% that it says there of Arlington households, if you consider that we have 19,000 households. We were asking uh, respondents to, res to opine about how they would solve the problems this year of the projected deficit. So in the inside cover, we will have the demographics of all those who responded. And you can study those, they're on the page two. And then we go to the sort of service and revenue questions by department. So respondents were asked how they would deal with the deficit with and uh, available funds. They were to choose one of four options, make the full cuts, use pay as you throw, uh, favor a three-year override, or favor a five-year override. And they went department by department. So let's consider the fire department. The fire department, people chose an override-based solution by 51.9%, then pay as you throw by 26%, and full cuts 
by 21%. In general, next slide, of all the departments, and you'll find them on pages three through five, uh, the challenges to each department brought this response. An override-based solution was much larger than a pay-as-you-throw solution was indeed much larger than full cuts. In fact, no precinct uh, voted for full cuts as a solution. Then we, we asked these questions about the schools, but we also asked people that if they favored either pay as your throw or a three or five year override, what would they like to preserve in the schools? And this is just a partial uh, chart of what they said, but 899 households said that they would choose all of the options that were there, and the rest it come in those orders. So, for instance, the top level would choose music and art and so forth. There were 12, there were 12 options. Then we came to questions about three ways to address the deficit. The first was, would you support a three-year override in general? Would you support a five-year override in general? And do you support pay as you throw? Next slide. For the override-based solution, and by the way, this, this survey was available online as well as on paper, 61.8% uh, of the respondents chose either a three or a five-year override solution. Then we come to some of the details that Josh was able to extract from this survey because we asked so many questions about the demography. How many years you've lived here? Do you own and rent, rent your house? Are you over 65? Uh, are you over 85? Uh, are you, do you have children in the public schools? Do you have children in the schools, et cetera? And tomorrow when you get your, uh, when this is up on the, on the website, you'll be able to find answers to these questions by those demographic categories. Then we came to support for pay as you throw. And indeed, 64.6% uh, .6 of the respondents favored pay, uh, supporting pay as you throw in general, not applied to any department, but just in general, while 35.4% did not. And we'd just like to thank all the people who responded. And uh, we, if you have any questions, you can ask either Josh or me. We're here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Howard. <laughs> Mr. Gil Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer, Town Meeting Member from Precinct 13. Move that the Treasurer's report to Town Meeting be received. All in favor of receiving the report? It's so Opposed? It is so received. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I promise I will not sing the report, nor will I read it. Um, you don't want to hear me sing, trust me. Um, the report is in the back of the hall on the table. There are 300 copies. Uh, the report... Uh, provides uh, information on cash flow, uh, investments, income by category, town debt, and uh, trust fund uh, portfolio performance. So I trust you will find it all wonderful late night reading. Uh, just as a highlight, I'd like to let town meeting members know that the uh, investment portfolio uh, had a net gain of 12.57% in the last calendar year. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. Mr. Trembley, did you have a report? Hey, Trembley, Precinct 19. Uh, Mr. Moderator, could I ask for the, uh, if we could have a town resident, the chairman of the uh, tree committee come and speak before town meeting? Okay, so you're reporting for the tree committee? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure, he, he or she can come on up. She's a town resident. 
Okay. Who, who is she? Uh, it, Sally Nash. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Sally Nash, Chair of the Arlington Tree Committee. I have a, a brief report for town meeting on the activities of the, the committee over the last uh, six or nine months since June. So with the help of Clarissa Rowe, Jim Dodge, and various other individuals, the, the tree committee had, was brought from dormancy in June of last year. Since then, the new committee has established a presence at community events, such as Town Day and EcoFest, and has redeveloped the original Tree Committee website into a resource for a broad range of tree-related information. We've supported the town's efforts to halt NSTAR's unsightly and damaging trimming of the town trees, and most recently, with the help of the DPW's tree division, we've organized a pilot program for volunteer-based planting of town trees. In the absence of funds in the town budget, 40 trees were purchased and funded by the Trees Please Committee, sorry, account. About 40% of these trees were planted by the homeowners who had requested them, and the remainder were planted by volunteers. <clears throat> in future years, the committee aims to increase the number of trees planted to at least equal the two to 300 that are lost each year. And to this end, we plan to initiate a precinct-based volunteer tree planting effort and to actively raise funds for the Trees Please account. We will continue to support a negotiated end to NSTAR's destructive practices and to expand the website's content and interface with the tree division. Special thanks go to Jim Dodge and the tree division for, for doing more with less. Our first tree planting day was a success thanks to John Deutschman's excellent planting demonstration and the many volunteers, including homeowners, members of the Cub Scout Troop 306 and the Boy Scout Troop 313, and Peter Lundstrom and the workplace program at Arlington High School. The committee would also like to thank Jim Dodge and Clarissa Rowe for their ongoing support and guidance. And a full report of the, the committee has been posted on the committee's website, arlingtontrees.org. And for information about the, the precinct-based volunteer tree planting effort, please talk to the town members who also serve on the tree committee, namely Andrew Fisher, Walter Phillips, Clarissa Rowe, Ed Trombley, and Greg Watt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Nash. Um, Mr. Moderator in town meeting, I stand to abolish the original tree committee. As you know, the members of the original tree committee are now part of this committee. So I'm asking you to abolish the original tree committee. Okay. Um, can I have a second on the motion to abolish that committee? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The original committee is abolished. Um, Ms. Harrington, did you, did you have a report? I guess not. Mrs. Harrington, I thought someone said she had a report. No. All right, Mrs. Starks. Good evening. Cindy Starks, Precinct 8, Chair of the Arlington School Committee. Town meeting members have already received the Arlington Public Schools town meeting report. It was on your chairs on Monday, April 25th. But because town meeting will not be addressing town budgets until the override vote on June 7th, which is certainly a reasonable plan, I wanted to address it briefly before town meeting recesses. First, I want you to know that our town has a wonderful school system with students achieving at ever higher levels, where students are challenged and supported to the best of their abilities from kindergarten through graduation. This year, Arlington High School won a silver, second silver medal award from US News and World Report, as well as a highly competitive award from the College Board 
for increasing the number of students taking AP exams while also improving AP test scores. And for those of you without students at the high school, AP stands for Advanced Placement, and those are classes that high school seniors and juniors can take, and they actually, depending on their grade on the final exam, get college credit for those classes. Stratton Elementary School was Ms. given- Ms. Starks? The, yep. Are you gonna read this? We all can read. Can yep. you just give us the highlights? Yep. Yeah, okay. Stratton Elementary School was given the designation of a blue ribbon school from the U.S. Department of Education. And these are but a few of the many ways in which our schools and students have been recognized this year. Our students are motivated, energetic, and enthusiastic, and they make excellent use of all the resources that we give them. They make us proud, whether they are in the classroom, the playing fields, the art studio, raising funds for earthquake victims, or for the Relay for Life. Our students bring credit to the town, and the school committee hopes that our town will continue to support our students and our schools to the best of its abilities. This high performance continues due to the hard work of our teachers and our students, even though our schools have had to make service reductions in each of the past six years. It is important that you understand that any further cuts will negatively impact classroom environments, putting academic progress at risk. At this point, there is simply no way to protect class size and save program quality without restoring funding. The report you received outlines the budget the school committee approved on March 8, 2011, which reflected a budget without an override, as those were the funds available when the budget was approved and the report was created. If you have looked at the report or seen the full report posted on the website, you have seen the large cuts in personnel that are required to balance the school budget next year. Given these potential losses, we urge the selectmen to approve an override, and as you know, they have done just that. On June 7th, this town will vote on an override that will provide much needed funding for the schools in fiscal year 12. That is $3.2 million more than what was approved in the March 8th budget. The additional funds will, from the override allow the school system to maintain the current offerings and quality of service, as well as to provide the district with an additional $600,000. This will be used to get us closer to what we believe are the services that our students need, as well as reduce our currently high athletic fees. As chair of the school committee, I wanted to alert town meeting to the stark difference that a successful override would make to our school system. Without the override, the district will have 11 fewer classroom teachers in the high school, 12 fewer classroom teachers in the middle school, and 17 fewer classroom teachers in the elementary schools. That's a total reduction of 40 classroom teachers, or over 10% of our current teaching staff. The impact on our class sizes is enormous. Without the override, we will have classes ranging from 30 to 40 in the high school, and average class sizes of 31 in the middle school and 27 in the elementary schools, with some class sizes as large as 33. More important than those numbers are what these do to the students and their learning in those classrooms. At the elementary level, these teacher losses reduce the amount of time students get to spend in physical education, as well as increase class sizes to the point of negatively impacting time students interact one-on-one -on -one with uh, teachers. One second, Mr. Kakavar. What is your point? Yeah, and she's also reading the report word for word. Yeah, I understand your point, Mr. Kakavar. Yeah. I understand your point, um, but Ms. Starks, um, yes, we, we all can read. We can read your report word for word. You're just reading it to us. Can you summarize for us or give us a This point? is a summary of Mr. the report Mr. that Mr. was Deist. given. This is why I don't want to get into an override debate on town meeting floor. Mr. Deist. I understand that. I'm letting her give her report, but our, we have asked people right along not to read reports word for word to us because we can read if she can hit the highlights for us. 
This is the highlights. The report is what was on the chairs no more, on no Monday. No more discussions. Everybody, pages. let Mr. Stock have the floor, please. Continue. As a middle school teacher myself, I can tell you that the middle school reductions are the ones that make me the most sad because getting rid of the team teaching at the middle school in the seventh and eighth grades means that middle school teachers do not get a chance to get to know one student as well as they should. Um, and that can very negatively affect their learning. Without an override, the system will suffer reductions in areas ranging from physical education to reading and math support, from guidance, social workers, and administrator positions to elimination of all traffic supervisors. Altogether, the override budget allows us to keep almost 70 more positions no, than the non-override budget. If the school system had not already had to make service reductions totaling over $7 million in the last six years, these cuts might not be so hard to bear. But as it is, they push an already stretched system to an untenable edge. It was only 11 short years ago that my oldest child entered the Arlington Public Schools. At that time, it cost $1,000 to send her to kindergarten. She was in a class of 17 students. There were full-time librarians. She had art and music both twice a week and PE three times a week. She also had a Spanish class twice a week, and we had enough crossing guards to make sure that she was safe on those days she walked to school, and when she didn't, the bus she rode to get to Bishop was free. I'm sad to say that none of these things are true in our schools today. Today it costs $3,000 to send your child to kindergarten, over $250 to ride the bus, and you know what our athletic fees are like. Our class sizes continue to grow, and our education for our students will continue to decrease. I urge you to continue to compare the Arlington Public Schools with and without an override in your conversations with friends and neighbors. I urge you to attend many of the forums and coffees being held on the override and for more information on our schools and their financial needs. I thank you for this opportunity to provide you with a report on the Arlington Public Schools and want you to know that the future of our schools, our students, and our town is in your hands. Thank you. Mr. Cole. And Ms. Stocks, in the future, if you're handing it out, you're not going to read it to us. Bullet points. That's what we do. We all can read. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Cole, Chairman of the Permanent Town Building Committee. I'll give you a brief overview of our activities in the last uh, year. There are boards out in the lobby. I'd be happy to meet and talk with anybody during the break, and I believe there are other representatives here as well. Our most visible projects are the two fire stations, Highland and Central. Uh, the Highland station is a complete renovation, exterior and interior. We expect it to be complete uh, middle of July. I think anybody who goes by there sees it's a very tight site with a lot of activity right now, but we are restoring this building to uh, its full historic character and also pursuing uh, LEED Silver certification as part of the town's interest in improving the sustainability of our properties. Central Station, at this point, we are only repairing the building envelope. This was done on an emergency basis to stop water infiltration and also as a safety measure uh, to repair some cornices which we were afraid might topple and do damage to people or property. The two projects combined are about $5.4 million. I expect at the end of the day we will return between $350,000 and $400,000 to the town for other purposes. The Community Safety Building is the second uh, project we've been working on this year. It is a multi-year project. Phase one was repair of the plaza between the Community Safety Building and Cusack Terrace. It involved ripping up 
about uh, football fields worth of deck over a parking structure and replacing uh, the waterproofing membrane, adding new landscaping and other amenities on the top. There's a lovely photo of that in the lobby. And I'd like to thank the Arlington Housing Authority for their contribution to that project of about $110,000. Uh, total project cost was 1.6 million, and I believe uh, we have just voted to return 100,000 in contingency back to the town for other purposes. Uh, lastly, is the Stratton School, where the Capital Planning Committee has uh, provided funding over a two-year period to make continuing improvements. Phase one, which replaced the roof. Uh, increased the amount of insulation and some minor repairs to the envelope was completed last summer under budget uh, the $125,000 excess was rolled over to phase two which started on April 16th during the recent school vacation uh, we will be replacing windows putting in a new boiler and improving uh, technology uh, throughout this, the classroom ring uh, we learned about midway through the project that we might be eligible for state reimbursement under a green schools program. Um, through the cooperation of the school department, the finance committee, and others, we were able to put together the application for that and are currently negotiating with the state uh, for reimbursement. I can't tell you how much it will be, but I do believe it will be a substantial amount. Members of the building committee also serve on the Thompson School Committee, but that uh, report will be covered by others, so I will skip over it uh, here tonight. Lastly, if you'll indulge me a moment, I'd like to give you a little editorial comment about why I think this town is doing a good job in hard times. We know budgets are tight. We're trying to squeeze every penny, and I want you to know you've got people who are working hard to accomplish that. I'd like to single out a few. On the fire station projects, uh, the work of the fire chief has been exemplary. By my <coughs> calculations, he's saved us over $300,000. Number one, by figuring out a clever solution to housing the displaced company from the Highlands, Highland Station on other town property, so we didn't have to rent trailers as we did at Park Circle. And secondly, he's been amazingly resourceful in getting other town departments to help us complete work that might have been done through change order with the general contractor. By doing this, he saved us at least $50,000. I'd also like to salute I'd also like to salute the school department, uh, CFO Diane Johnson, who I think very cleverly figured out that we could fold the green uh, schools repair program into the Stratton renovations. As I say, the reimbursement amount is under negotiation, but the town will be receiving a substantial amount back. It's allowed us to increase the scope of the project and reduce the net cost to the citizens. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Capital Planning Committee. Over the past few years, uh, we've had more interchanges, and I think it has allowed us as a building committee to have more flexibility in sequencing projects in ways that save operational funds, and it's also helped us with some cash flow issues on the, uh, the Stratton School to make us eligible for this reimbursement. Thank you. I'll be in the hall at the break. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Any other reports or committees? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 3 is on the table. Okay, and Mr. Moderator, uh, ask the town meeting for a little indulgence here. I would like to move to table Articles 24 through 56, so that we could take up the capital budget. When we finish the capital budget, we'll go into the special town meeting, take care of the Stratton and the Thompson schools, and then once that's finished, 
dissolve the special, and return to the annual. This way we can deal with them all at the same time. So again, I move to table articles 24 through 56. All in favor of tabling, please say yes. yes. Opposed? They are tabled. That brings us to Article 57, the capital budget. Mr. Foskett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 8, Chairman of the uh, Capital Planning Committee. And um, for the report on the uh, capital budget, we'll uh, need only 10 minutes, but we will ask the in, uh, indulgence of the uh, meeting to give us more time when we get into the uh, special town meeting and discuss the Thompson project. Good. Okay, um, what I'd like to do first of all, if, if we go to um, the next slide, please, is just introduce the Capital Planning Committee. Steve Andrew is a citizen appointee. John Fitzmorris, who is a town meeting member. John, are you here? John's not here, okay. Um, is a member of the committee. Um, Adam uh, Chapdelaine, the, uh, the deputy town manager. Steve Gilligan is the uh, vice chairman, is the town treasurer. Ruth Lewis. Comptroller Anthony Lionetta and uh, Diane Johnson and Barbara Thornton are all uh, members of the Capital Planning Committee. And these folks uh, start work in uh, September, work through January to come up with a capital, uh, capital budget to present to the uh, town manager and the board of selectmen. And um, I would just like to, to note the uh, hard work and the effort that they put in. Today, the top, <laughs> thank you. Topics I'd like to uh, review with you are just a little bit about our history of spending and the capital budget and how it's different this year. Um, some details of the vote and the financial impact that it will have uh, on this year's budget and future years. How our uh, debt profile appears and um, what our pr uh, past pro program progresses, uh, progress in our past programs and some new initiatives. I'd like to point out that we gave, we, we passed out the uh, capital um, budget report at the first night of town meeting. And uh, when I refer to some charts, you can find those charts and that data uh, in this yellow book. It's a yellow front cover, white back cover. The first uh, table I'd like to draw your attention to is uh, figure two, which is the five-year history by funding source. And you'll notice that um, on this uh, chart, uh, 2012 is substantially lower in all respects than prior years. And there are two reasons for that. The overall uh, budget squeeze that we're in this year has forced us to lower our overall expenses. And secondly, uh, because we are anticipating funding the Thompson project partially out of the non-exempt capital budget, we've had to uh, further squeeze down our, our uh, capital expenditures within the normal uh, capital plan. The next uh, chart that I'd like to draw your attention to is uh, table one, which is, um, uh, uh, shows the difference between this year and last year. And just very explicitly, the cash expenditures, that is the money that you vote uh, to, to be directly spent without borrowing money, is down 32% this year. The new debt service is down 64%. And uh, our application of reserves are down 74%. Uh, so the capital budget from a total uh, financial viewpoint is, um, is, is somewhat uh, more conservative than uh, last year. The next uh, slide is table two on your, um, in your capital report. And this is the reconciliation of the tax impact. Now, I wanna mention that the, um, what you're being asked to vote is in the the, the, the formal vote is in the report of the Finance Committee under Article 57. It's also contained in the report of the uh, Capital Planning Committee, but the, uh, the formal official vote is, is in the uh, Finance Committee report. And this table uh, just reconciles the, the uh, exempt and non-exempt budgets. And the bottom line number there, that $8,444,825, which includes cash expenditures, 
and includes um, both exempt and non-exempt debt is what, is what you'll see in uh, the bottom line of Section 1 of Article uh, 57 of the recommended vote. Now, Table 4 in the Capital Report describes the, um, the way we do our planning. Now, the first, uh, let me mention that the, the detailed expenditures in the Capital Report are contained for uh, the budget year, for fiscal year 2012, are con contained on um, Exhibit 1, uh, which is right after the written section of the report. Those are the specific items that are in, um, thanks, IT department provides a lot of services, appreciate it. Um, so the, the, the uh, specific items which you can feel free to ask any questions about are in Exhibit 1 in the Capital Report, and then Exhibit 2 is the five-year plan. And Table 4, which you see um, behind me here on the screen, shows the summary of the uh, individual budget categories for fiscal year 2012, that's, that's the capital budget that you're being asked to vote this year, and then our forecast of future expenses uh, over the next five years. Now the reason we put together the uh, five-year forecast is because we are asking you to borrow money that has to be paid back in future years, and that happens every year in the capital budget. So if you look and you see there's a, there's a line that says uh, prior non-exempt debt, that's, um, that's where we're paying for past trans transgressions, okay? That's the money we borrowed in the past. It's the debt service that we're paying down over time. Then the, the cash expenditures, uh, the next line, are the 633400 That's what we're asking you to vote this year. And then we're forecasting in future years the uh, cash numbers that you see to the right. And then the line, the new non-exempt debt service, this is our forecast of what the debt service is gonna look like in the future. So the sum of that is the total non-exempt debt. Now we have an agreement, uh, the Capital Planning Committee at the request of the Finance Committee has agreed to, to keep its proposed budgets within 5% of the annual budget. And that's what we reconcile in this table. So there's a line that says uh, pro forma budget. And what, what that is, is that's the, um, the budget that the town has adjusted by taking out, uh, taking out of the budget um, enterprise funds and the water and sewer uh, items, uh, which are um, the water and sewer. I'm looking at this yellow light flashing, it's distracting. Um, <laughs> the water and sewer items, which are, which are paid for by fees. So, so this table basically shows you that uh, we stay within 5% of the budget. Um, on, on the next slide, uh, we, we see the total debt estimates. And the, uh, this is different than you, figure four in your book is different than you've seen in past years because even though we haven't gotten into the special town meeting yet, we've anticipated that the town meeting might support the Thompson project. And if you do vote for it, you can see that the estimated new exempt debt for Thompson is included in figure four. Even with that new exempt debt, the total debt for, for Arlington is still um, in, the, in the range of 17 to 19 percent of the total um, debt that the uh, uh, Department of Revenue would allow Arlington based on its, uh, its total uh, 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 equalized valuation. And that statutory limit is $346 million. And, and our debt runs around $60 million. The total debt right now is around $60 million. So we're, we're well, well within the uh, total uh, amount of debt permitted by, by state law and in a relatively conservative position. Uh, in the spirit of the moderator, I won't take you through all of the details of the program progress that we have, but you can f see, see those uh, enumerated uh, behind me and they're also listed in the capital report. Um, there's a, I have a quick summary here of uh, potential Stratton Green Grant impact and I guess listening to John Cole, I'm not supposed to mention the impact. So we'll flash that in front of you and uh, while, they're, while the negotiations with the state are going on, but let me say that we hope that the town is going to save a substantial amount of money. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's basically due to the creative work of the school department and the uh, permanent town building committee. 
We are asking you in Article 57 to move a $200,000 bond that we had previously forecast for 2013 into 2012 so the money can be spent and the work can be finished this year so that the town can qualify for this green grant, which, will have a, which hopefully will be a substantial and uh, unspecified amount of money. Um, finally, just a couple of points on new initiatives. The Capital Planning Committee is working on um, cr creating a maintenance committee, not part of the Capital Planning Committee, but a separate committee. We'll come back to you with a proposal on that next year. Barbara Thornton is, is uh, working pretty aggressively on that. And hopefully the efforts of the maintenance committee will lower some of the overall uh, capital uh, outlays that we have to make. And secondly, uh, this year uh, we met with the uh, disability committee and uh, for the first time we've explicitly included some improvements associated with uh, the, the, the disability program. Uh, wrapping up, um, we have also uh, cut the amount of money spent on um, copy machines and, and copiers this year by uh, $57,000. And that's basically by not funding uh, any new copiers or any replacement copiers. So people whose leases have run out, they have to continue to use the old machine. Um, the town management has committed to come up with a document strategy, document management strategy, strategy next year, which hopefully will include uh, some clever approaches to um, saving, saving money such as using uh, perhaps a, Adobe uh, Acrobat more often and, and things like that, that would reduce some of the paper that's being used in the town and some of the impact uh, that it has on uh, requiring expensive copiers. So in summary, um, uh, and also let me mention that we'll discuss completely the uh, Thompson Project under the Special Town Meeting uh, Article 5. If, uh, if you vote the Article 57 Capital Plan, we will move no action on Article 4 in the Special Town Meeting. So we respectfully ask for your favorable vote on uh, Article 57, and we'll be pleased to answer any specific questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. Mr. Leonard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Um, with your approval of uh, going through the Capital Planning Committee budget, I came across what appears to be a typographical error, which I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, if people would be kind enough to notice that an Exhibit 5, page 3 of 3 of the Capital Planning Report, again, I suggest that it's just a typographical error. Uh, about the fifth or sixth line down, money has been allotted in 2011 for the Wellington Park Playground and Tennis Court. But then if you were to turn so many pages before that to Exhibit 2, page 4 or 5, in the five-year plan for 2016, more money has been allotted for the Wellington Playground after I had a conversation with Mr. Conley of Parks and Recreation, it was decided that that was a typographical error, and he informed me that the money that is set aside for 2011 is only to go for the tennis courts, not the playground, and the playground will be taken care of in the 2016 budget. So I would like, if possible, to bring that to everybody's attention to make that correction. Thank you. Do you, do you agree with that, Mr. Foskett? I do. Okay, so we can just eliminate tennis court from the 2011 line item on page. No, the playground. tennis court playground. stays, Mr. Tennis court stays in, so playground goes away. Right, playground okay. comes back in 2016. All right, so we can make um, that administratively. We'll strike the word playground and um, exhibit three of three, page three of three, exhibit five. If that's okay with you, Mr. Foskett. It's all right with me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Jameson. Uh, Gordon Jameson, uh, Precinct 12. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, first, I want to thank the Capital Planning Committee. I know Mr. Fosk has been traveling, and uh, we welcome him home and uh, for the hard work, and is also to the Permanent Town Building Committee. Um, I had a question about the um, comments made by the Permanent Down Building Committee in reference to the capital plan. 
um, when they return funds, how are they disposed? Do we apply them to other projects, or does Mr. Gilligan move to have us rescind borrowing activity? How do you plan to do that? If you read the uh, vote in Article 57 and previous votes that uh, the town meeting has taken, uh, unused funds are, are retained in the vote until uh, otherwise disposed of. So uh, if it's cash, meaning, uh, not, not bonded, the um, town manager and the capital planning committee can apply those to other capital projects in general. If it's, uh, if it's money that's borrowed, it's borrowed under a specific section of state law. Those are noted in the, in the vote. And they, the, the funds, if they're applied to other uses, can only be applied to uses within those categories. OK, so if it's something for fire stations, we could use it for the additional work on the next stage of Central, but not, not on a school. Uh, I believe, I, I'm just doing this from memory, but I believe you, the category is town building, so you could use it for virtually anything in okay. town building. Thank you. But you can't use it for a fire truck. Well, I, I, know, I know we're using these very appropriately, and, and the permanent town building committee, uh, each and every time they come up here, they tell us how they've saved us money, which is quite impressive. Um, uh, Mr. Foskett, you, you talked about exempt versus non-exempt uh, debt, and as I recall, the terminology exempt means things that we voted for outside of uh, the normal property tax revenues. These would be debt exclusions, uh, is that correct? Yes. Um, and uh, I note that uh, it is the general policy, at least as I understand it, of the Capital Planning Committee to include as many things in the non-exempt debt, that's the regular property taxes, um, expenditures as possible, is that correct? Well, in other um, words, we try to pay for as many things as possible out of the property taxes without going to voters for a debt exclusion. Oh, in that sense, yes. Okay, and I, I note that we do have a large uh, amount of debt not that we should go out and spend it all and run up our credit card debt, but uh, in the future I hope we will balance the, uh, the use of uh, um, dear, near and dear property tax revenues with the ability to uh, go out and uh, talk to the voters about debt exclusions. Of course, after any override exclusion period, so to speak, would be over. Uh, I note the $7 million that we put in that sticks us up, up as that large, uh, in figure two or three, I think, uh, that we did last year. Um, I'm saddened again, um, just as general comment, that the, the parks uh, in these uh, times of dire straits uh, don't get uh, very much spent on them, the parks and fields in Exhibit 2. And as a, a, a butter to the Robbins Farm, um, I, as I understand it, only portion of the cost of uh, replacing the slide there, which is, I, I believe, a town-wide asset, was funded by the Capital Planning Committee. I would, would have hoped that that would have uh, been fully funded, given the cost. Um, also in Exhibit 3, there's an, uh, there's an item, uh, 268000 in change for LED streetlights. Perhaps you or the manager could speak to the fact of whether any of that is reimbursable, reimbursable or that's being leveraged through the green communities. Adam Chapdelaine, Deputy Town Manager. Uh, that amount uh, referencing the LED streetlights is from the Green Communities Grant. The Capital Planning Committee this year decided to begin reporting uh, all grant amounts in the capital plan. So what you see there is attributable to the... So that would fall into the category of other as far as funding sources? Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I applaud that, uh, that measure, that move to report those in the Planning Committee. Um, I also note that the uh, town uh, PC program, for example, is scheduled at $60,000 for the coming year. Now, I just helped a friend look up the cost of a PC. She could get a really nice one for about $329, $329. Um, wh what are we doing with $60,000 of PCs or microcomputer program for the town? Well, um, I guess I'd like to ask Mr. Good to respond to that, but I would say that um, that $329 PC probably doesn't have any expensive software in it. So that, um, typically, the uh, cost of PCs is when, when it's equipped with the tools that the people need to work with are substantially more than $329, okay? Does Mr. Good wish to add anything to that? Mr. Mar through the Mr. Mr. Moderator? Good, do you want to add anything to that? Good. Uh, David Good, uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, included in that line item uh, is, is not just PCs, it is uh, uh, network switching gear, servers, uh, wiring, uh, closet hardware, and uh, printers and uh, multi-purpose devices, which include scanner fax uh, and other equipment. Uh, the, the network gear outfits 27 buildings, 
There is uh, over 225 switches across the town. There's over uh, 150 switches within the schools. So uh, it, it, it's, it's a misleading uh, title for that line item. And thank you, Mr. Good. That's very um, illustrative of, of what needs to be done there and very helpful. Um, I have only one last question, Mr. F oh, actually, one question and one suggestion. Um, while you were um, overseas, um, I, Mr. F Mr. Tosti tried to attempt to answer my question about the use of antenna funds this year. Um, we established that no time in the past has any funds from that reached the limit where someone would be returned to the general fund and that you're using 110000 this year. Um, but again, on the actual, um, and this may be a minor technicality, on the actual budget this year, I only saw $40,000 at park and rec expenditures. The, the, um, the antenna funds uh, are specifically set aside for parks and recreation funding uh, for capital that, projects. That, that, yeah, that came but, out in the meeting earlier. Okay, so we have uh, in the uh, debt, sir, I mean, we, we for example, uh, over the last several years, we've put approximately four or $500,000 a year into various parks and, and playgrounds, okay? And that's been borrowed. So okay. we apply the antenna funds to the payment of the debt service on those projects. When, when you borrow the money the, in the specific um, fiscal year, only one half percent, I'm um, sorry, one half of the first year's interest shows up in the capital budget and the debt service in the inf ensuing years, I mentioned that line, the uh, prior debt service, contains uh, significant funds that are um, being paid for prior parks and recreation expenditures. Okay. That's what we apply the uh, okay. kind of funds to. Okay, and I apologize for giving you the blinking light <laughs> by being over here. And my last suggestion was when I first joined the meeting um, seven or eight years ago, there was another type of uh, um, a report in the back uh, I know it's a very difficult report to do. You, you have, you have uh, a projection of future debt service additions and the actually amounts we'd be paying in one of your charts. I think it's uh, Exhibit 6, as I recall. We used to have an exhibit that showed what we were paying off for um, from the past um, town meetings uh, backwards. So you have the forward-looking one. You have the history of actually what we did in dollar amounts over the last couple of years. But there used to be a, a very nice table that um, would provide you an example. I, I believe the, um, the library was done in 1992 or 1994. We're still paying for the library. So I think as a town meeting member, it's very il illustrative of the, the depth and breadth of the impact of the, the committee's work over the years to, to understand which parks and which schools and, and which buildings we're, we're still paying for. And perhaps in conjunction with the uh, the um, uh, treasurer, you might be able to, to reinstate that at some date in the future. I know it's a lot of work to ask, and, and um, if you can't do it, that's fine as well. Well, I, just to answer the question, I don't think we ever did that. Um, and the, it's not, um, the, the um, uh, bonds are sold in aggregate um, uh, instruments. Okay. And, and it's not possible to unravel that. And especially, for example, about two years ago, the treasurer refinanced a whole bunch of bonds because the interest rates are very low. So, and you just lose all that specificity when okay. you do that. Yeah, they're lumped into one, one bucket, exactly. and, and the treasurer did a good job there in saving us some money. Yep. Okay. Um, excellent work. Thank you very much, Mr. Basket. Thank you. Mr. Chappett? Mr. Gilligan? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer, Vice Chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. Welcome back, Charlie. If, uh, if town meeting members would like a breakdown of debt project by project, I'll be happy to put that together for you. Thank you. Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John, John Warden, Precinct 8. Uh, I noticed that despite the um, uh, smaller amount being appropriated for the numerous photocopiers we buy every year. Um, it's just a question about one. Some years ago, at the instance of uh, retired uh, town meeting member Jacqueline Harrington, a photocopier here in the annex uh, was made available for town meeting members. And um, this year, went looking for it and was informed by the town clerk that that machine has been taken away. 
So I just wondered if there was going to be any replacement for town meeting members to be able to make copies for this meeting. Thank you. It's not in the capital plan. <laughs> I think the manager originally had made that available. Mr. Sullivan, is there a machine town man meeting members can use if they want to make and distribute proposed motions? They should just contact Mr. Sullivan's office. Okay. Any other um, questions, comments? Seeing none. Okay. We have before us the recommended vote of the Finance Committee, which is the same as the Capital Plan Committee, as printed in your report, to spend... A whole, whole ton of money. It's a first we're going to take a voice vote. I'm going to take it as one big vote, be, even though there are three parts to it, because we're going to vote on the whole thing. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It is a unanimous vote, and I so declare. Ms. Rainville, do you declare 285 members are present in voting? Yes, she does. So, oh, you're not Ms. Rainville anymore. <laughs> She's right. She's not. <laughs> okay, because we, that was vote bonding, we have unanimous vote. We don't have to take a standing vote. Okay, Mr. Tosti, do you want to put everything else on the table and take up the special? Sorry about that. Yes, I move that we recess the annual town meeting and uh, take up Article 4 in the special town meeting. Second. Um, we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, that brings us to Article 4 of the Special Town Meeting. Mr. Foskett. Recommended vote of the FinCom is no actions. That's still true. Yes. Yes. All in favor of no action on Article 4, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote. That brings us to Article 5 of the Special. Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> I'd like to ask the uh, permission of the town meeting to uh, have up to an hour to uh, present uh, Article 5. This is a uh, $20 million expenditure for the uh, Thompson School project. Um, and uh, we'd like to open with a presentation by Jeff Thielman on, the, um, uh, for, on behalf of the Thompson School Building Committee. There's been a I have you, Mr. Leonard. There's been a request for one hour of time for the um, presentation. Is that seconded? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Aye. Let's try that again. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okay, my opinion is an affirmative vote. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thielman? Mr. Oh, okay, Mr. Thielman. The original report. The original report. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, members of town meeting. My name is Jeff. Doesn't work? Yeah, that middle mic doesn't work too well. You've got to get the volume up or something. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> Jeff Thielman, Precinct 12, a member of the school committee. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, Let's make it a quick recess because we have a whole bunch of kids up here. So let's take a seven minute recess. Thank you. Um, there's the the um, high school girls are selling cookies and stuff. Go out and Enjoy. support their endeavor. All right, we're going to come back in. Um,
Mr. Oh, Mr. Thielman has the floor. Please sit down. Mr. Thielman has the floor. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Thielman, Precinct 12, a member of the school committee and a member of the Thompson School Building Committee. I'm honored to present the report of the Thompson School Committee uh, to you tonight. I'm going to talk about why we want to build a new school and what it will look like, and Mr. Foskett is going to follow and talk about the finances of the project. In the hall to answer your questions tonight are George Metzger from HMFH Architects and our uh, owner's project manager, Kevin Nigro. So both men are here, and if there are technical questions, they can uh, take your questions. The Thompson School Building Committee includes Dr. Kathleen Bodie, John Cole, the chairman of the Permanent Town Building Committee, Sherry Donovan, the principal of the Thompson School, Diane Fisk Johnson, our chief financial officer, Toby Jackson, a Thompson parent, Rob Jusela, a member of the Permanent Town Building Committee, Dominic Lanzalotti, the town purchasing manager, Anthony Lionetta, a member of the Capital Planning Committee, Mark Miano, the facilities manager of the town, Suzanne Robinson, who was here a bit ago, she's a member of the Permanent Town Building Committee, Bill Shea from the Permanent Town Building Committee, Brian Sullivan, and myself. I want to recognize two members of the, of the uh, Thompson School Building Committee. I'm not even sure if they're in the hall, but they've done outstanding work over the past 13 years of the rebuild project, and that's John Cole and Bill Shea. The Thompson School Building Committee advises the superintendent who is responsible under the law for the management of any building project funded by the Massachusetts School Building Authority, also known as the MSBA. The Thompson School Building Committee has the responsibility of ensuring that the school is built within the budget approved by town meeting and the MSBA and that the district adheres to all MSBA requirements. In town-wide referenda in 1998 and 2000, Arlington's voters approved the rebuilding and or renovation of the town's seven elementary schools. Between 2000 and 2005, five elementary schools were rebuilt with the majority of the costs being paid with funds from the former School Building Assistance Bureau known as the SBAB. The SBAB was replaced in 2004 by the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority. There were many changes under the new SBA, MSBA, including an increased role in the management of construction projects by the authority, the state authority, and a change in the reimbursement rate for the town of Arlington from 63% to 47%, approximately 47%. The last two of the seven schools to be repaired or rebuilt in Arlington are the Thompson, which was built in the 1950s, and the Stratton, which was built in 1962 and added to in 1968. The district completed statements of interest to the MBA for both the Stratton and the Thompson, and the Thompson was uh, accepted because it need, was older and needed more repairs. As John Cole told you this evening, we are making improvements to the Stratton from the town's capital budget, as well as from the MSBA green repair funds. The school that was approved for rebuild is the Thompson, which as of October 1st, 2010, had 336 students and is the most racially and economically diverse school in our town. 32% of Thompson students are young people of color, and 27% of the school population qualifies for the federal free reduced lunch program, meaning their family income is at 185% or less of the federal poverty level. 16% of the students at the Thompson received English as a second language services, 14% received Title I services, and for 26% of the children at the Thompson School, English is not their first language. It is a wonderful school community with outstanding teaching, excellent leadership, and devoted parents, grandparents, and guardians who give an enormous amount of time and effort to the school. Those of us who have spent time in the school know that it needs serious repairs. All of the major building systems need to be replaced, and the school is not fully accessible to disabled students. 
The existing mechanical system is well beyond its predicted useful life. The roofs and windows need to be replaced. Special education spaces are inadequate. The toilet facilities are subpar. There is a poor security and technology system in the building. The building does not have a sprinkler system and there is an inefficient layout for parking and drop off. By beginning the Thompson project during the 2011-12 school year, we eliminate the need for potential costly repairs to the facility and its systems. Slide eight in the presentation lists the sizes and October 1st enrollments of each of our elementary schools. This is something to refer to as our discussion proceeds this evening. For a point of reference, the new Thompson School will be close to the sizes of the Brackett and the Hardy schools. Over the past several months, our committee has worked closely with the Capital Planning Committee, the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, and the MSBA to design a school that fits within a $20 million total project budget. In February of 2011, the MSBA voted to move our project to schematic design phase, meaning the MSBA Board of Directors believes a new school is needed and should be built as long as the town can provide its share of funds and the architects design a building that adheres to all MSBA standards. The schematic design will be submitted to the MSBA this summer and we expect that our architects and owner's project manager will make sure that we meet all requirements to secure a favorable vote of the MSBA in July of 2011. Our expected reimbursement rate from the MSBA is 47.2%. Upon a two-thirds vote of this body this evening and an affirmative vote from the MSBA board in July, the MSBA and the superintendent will sign a project funding agreement this summer. Demolition of the existing Thompson School will take place this fall, and then design development and construction bidding takes place with the goal of beginning the project in the spring of 2012. Our goal is to complete the project by August of 2013 and the MSBA has indicated to us that this is a realistic timetable. As you saw on page eight of the slide presentation, enrollment in our elementary schools is not evenly balanced. The MSBA has required the school committee to redistrict by the time the Thompson School opens. Next year, and during the 2012-13 school year, there will be many conversations between the community and the school committee about redistricting. In the fall of 2011, we will be moving students to the Stratton and Hardy schools with the possibility of some students moving to the Bishop. Principals Deb D'Amico of the Hardy, Alan Brown of the Stratton, and Sherry Donovan of the Thompson are meeting regularly to work out the details. The plans for the move are not yet final, and there will be many more meetings with parents from all schools impacted in the coming weeks. The new Thompson School will be a three-story structure with 56,348 square feet and the capacity to hold 380 students. The building will have 15 classrooms for grades one through five, kindergarten rooms, and art, music, reading, occupational therapy, speech, and language rooms, as well as a gymatorium, a gym and an auditorium, and a cafeteria. The central kitchen, the place where food is prepared for all elementary schools and stored for the entire district, will continue to be located at the new Thompson. The central kitchen saves the school district about $120,000 per year in our operating budget. Slide 14 details the estimated project cost. The current estimate of the, of the amount of the project that is reimbursable at the rate of 47.2% is 18.2 million. The Thompson School Building Committee, HMFH, and our owner's project manager will work aggressively to reduce cost and maximize the MSBA reimbursement. I want to take a few minutes, Dave, uh, to talk about the supplemental report that was placed in the hall tonight and that we sent to the listserv over the weekend. It's entitled Thompson School Building Committee Report, May 16, 2011, Supplemental Information. In the supplemental report, we attempt to answer questions that have been raised about the increase in the cost of MSBA sponsored projects. The presentation contains a comparison to the Dallin School, the most recent school built in Arlington. 
The whole 10-page report kind of boils down to four main reasons why costs have increased since 2004 when we last built a new school in the town. First, the producer price index, the price of producing goods, has risen twice as much as the consumer price index. Second, the Thompson site, the actual site where the building is going to take place, is larger than the Dallin site. Third, the Thompson has a central kitchen, which on a square foot basis is one and a half to two times more costly than typical spaces because of the concentration of equipment, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing infrastructure to support it. And fourth, and probably most importantly, the MSBA has more control and involvement in our project today than the old SBAB. The reason is to better manage costs and to ensure that projects are completed on time and within the agreed upon budget. There was a lot of publicity in recent years about high schools and other projects that went over budget and the MSBA put in requirements to make sure that doesn't happen again. As you can see in slide seven of the supplemental report, we are required to have an owner's project manager, all general and sub bidders have to be pre-qualified, and the MSBA closely monitors and manages the project by playing a role in the selection of the owner's project manager and architectural firm, as well as approving and overseeing the feasibility study and schematic design, project scope and budget agreement, construction design, construction administration, and project closeout. A benefit of increased MSBA involvement, there are many, many benefits, by the way, is that towns and cities receive funding from the state up front as the project is progressing. Some of you have raised, uh, have asked me about uh, what are we going to do about cost overruns, and I thought I would address it in this presentation. I tried to address it in the supplemental report. First, the MSBA process of control is very tight and designed to prevent surprises. So there shouldn't be any surprises at the end of the project. Secondly, we have an owner's project manager whose job is to secure the lowest cost bids we can find. And third, we have an experienced building committee, and as you heard from John Cole tonight, a member of our committee, the projects being overseen by the Permanent Town Building Committee have been uh, to date on time and under budget, and we expect and will work hard to emulate that success with Thompson. The bottom line in terms of the cost can be found on slide 10 of the supplemental report. As you can see, the total estimated cost per square foot of the Thompson project is comparable to a lower than other MSBA sponsored school construction projects at this time. So we're right in the market, we're right where we should be in terms of the plans for this project. I want to conclude by talking about Article 5. The passage by a two-thirds vote of this meeting of Article 5 guarantees local funding for the project and it empowers the school district to sign a project funding agreement immediately upon an affirmative vote of the MSBA this summer. Article 5 enjoys the unanimous support of the school committee, the board of selectmen, the finance committee, and the capital planning committee. And now it's your turn as town meeting to weigh in. Of all the votes you take this town meeting, the one that will be remembered is this one. Tonight's vote is about equity. It's about giving the Thompson neighborhood the same high quality facility as other districts in our town. Your vote will finance a project that will serve the town for at least 50 years. Most of us will meet very few of the thousands and thousands of young lives that will be changed by tonight's decision. Inside the new school, young people of multiple backgrounds will learn the skills and habits of mind they need to be good students and good citizens of our community. So tonight, let us stand up and vote yes for the people, the young people of the Thompson School. And tomorrow, let our students enter Thompson knowing that all of Arlington is behind them, their younger siblings and future students, because we are committed as a united community to making the dream of a new Thompson School a reality. It's now my pleasure to introduce Charlie Foskett, the chairman of the Capital Planning Committee, who, like John Cole and Bill Shea, has been involved in the rebuild effort since the inception. Thank you, Jeff. Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8, uh, chairman of the Capital Planning Committee, fellow town meeting members. Um, like to talk to you a little bit tonight about how we're going to pay for the school. 
And uh, let me start, if I may, with uh, a slide that uh, shows where we were in uh, 2000 at the uh, last uh, debt exclusion, the second debt exclusion campaign for the uh, second four schools that were to be completed. And um, David, sorry, we'll catch up. Let me let David catch up there. This, uh, it looks a little small to read up there, so maybe you could refer to your handout. There is a handout in, the, um, in your uh, seats that says um, Rebuilding Thompson, uh, Financing the Project. So I'm referring to uh, page three. And those uh, two snapshots there are actually from a presentation that the uh, Rebuild Campaign Committee gave back in uh, 2000. And you can see that we were anticipating doing the uh, Pierce, Dallin, Thompson, and Stratton. This was as uh, Jeff described, under the old SBAB uh, committee, not the new MSBA. And the total vote at the time was $34.5 million. We're going to refer, that was the amount that the citizens of the town voted uh, as a debt exclusion. And when the, um, the uh, presentations were proposed to the uh, voters, you can see in the left-hand slide there that we were anticipating in the first several schools 63% uh, reimbursement. Uh, we had the idea that that number was, uh, was going to be reduced to around 50% uh, for the later schools. On uh, the next slide, uh, just a, as a graphic here, school reconstruction costs. And it just, uh, I'm presenting that to give you the sense of the total investment program that Arlington has made uh, in its school infrastructure. And uh, I, I think this is an extremely um, commendable, uh, actually awe-inspiring uh, position of the voters of the town to take, that, that uh, over a period of uh, 10 or 12 years, uh, we've rebuilt uh, the entire elementary, or we hopefully will be rebuilding the entire elementary school structure. And this uh, graph doesn't uh, show, but we did uh, rebuild the Otteson in the uh, late 1990s. I won't dwell on this subject of the change from the SBAB to the MSBA because Jeff has explained it uh, quite adequately, um, but there are two important points here and um, they are to reflect on that previous slide because no doubt you've noticed that the, uh, the amount of money being requested uh, for the Thompson is substantially higher than the amount that has been requested for prior schools. And there are two reasons for that. One is that um, the original, in the original program, uh, we anticipated that these schools were gonna be rebuilt by 2004, maybe 2005 at the latest. And as you know, uh, during, the, um, during the Romney administration, there was a recession in the budget shortfall, and there was a freeze put on rebuilding schools, and that lasted for two or three years. Then the MSBA came around, so before you know it, here we are in uh, 2012, 12, 12, soon will be 12 years from when the first thought of this rebuild campaign uh, took place, thinking about um, rebuilding the Thompson. During that time, uh, on the one hand, we've had a tremendous escal escalation in commodity costs and labor costs and, um, and uh, other, other costs associated with building these facilities. But we've also had, as Jeff explained, a new regime by the MSBA where the uh, MSBA has imposed new standards and also a new rigor in, in building and controlling the uh, building process which has added to the cost. In addition, um, the MSBA is no longer reimbursing at a 63% rate but rather, uh, as Jeff described, at a 47% rate. Now, if you look at slide six, page six, um, I, I mentioned what the, the MSBA uh, requirements are. First of all, the MSBA has asked the town to present a schematics uh, drawings to the uh, MSBA by the end of July. And there is in existence an agreement between the MSBA and the town that if these schematics are approved, the town will qualify for the 47.2% uh, reimbursement. But the MSBA wants a full, unrestricted $20 million authorization vote, which is what we're asking from you tonight. 
That means that the town, if we vote this um, and this project goes ahead, the town is on the hook for $20 million. Now, if you look on page uh, seven of the presentation that's in your seats, the uh, title of that page is Rebuild Cost History and Balance. You see that the original uh, debt exclusion was 34.5 million. And um, 9 million was spent, 9.9 .9 million was spent on the Pierce, 11.8 million on the uh, Dallin, there were a total of 21.8 million, meaning uh, that there's uh, unused debt exclusion of $12.7 million. Against that, we're applying $6 million, that's a pro rata of the um, uh, reimbursement from the MSBA, and that means that uh, we are eventually going to be putting on the tax rate, or asking the Board of Selectmen to be putting on the tax rate uh, an exempt, additional exempt debt of $6.7 million. And by the way, these numbers are, you know, are all um, a little bit approximate because um, uh, interest rates change and, um, and what the uh, MSBA actually will qualify for reimbursement, it will, will, will move a little bit here and there, but these are pretty close. So of the remainder, um, six million will be funded by a portion of the MSB, MSBA reimbursement, and uh, the $6.7 million is in the new exempt debt, as I mentioned. So I've summarized this on page six. Where does the $20 million come from? Some of it is gonna come from new exempt bonds that were authorized by that April 1st, 2000 debt exclusion. Some of it will come from the capital budget that we just spoke about in Article 57. Um, in the future, in the uh, um, exhibit, I think it's the last exhibit, or next to last exhibit in the capital report, where we report on anticipated uh, debt service in the future, we've included the debt service for the, for the uh, Thompson project that we're talking about here in future non-exempt debt service. We also, town meeting has previously voted uh, non-exempt capital funds approximately $800,000 to be dedicated to the uh, Thompson School and these funds are, are uh, existing right now. And if you remember uh, many years ago, perhaps as many as uh, eight or nine years ago, uh, Jackie Harrington introduced a, an article in town meeting that said that any interest in the uh, school uh, accounts that um, uh, that are, uh, that, that's earned by funds from the s school projects sitting in bank accounts be set aside and used for the school building uh, projects. And we're collecting those uh, interest funds for this um, project. And in addition, uh, we are anticipating that there will be some disposition of the Parmenter or Crosby facilities and the capital funds from the sale of the long-term lease of these assets will be contributing towards the payment of the $20 million. So quantitatively, this is shown on page nine of the presentation. This is similar to the table that's in the back of the capital report, uh, except uh, it has been modified slightly because the Department of uh, Revenue adjusted, uh, gave us a recent number that adjusted the amount of the uh, uh, debt exclusion referendum balance to $12,704,107, and you see that at the top of the page. So if we uh, say that the, the project is uh, $20 million and there's a $1 million reserve and there's um, an estimated uh, non-reimbursable cost of um, $2 million in total, then this reimbursable project portion is approximately $18 million. This is slightly more conservative than the number that um, Jeff just mentioned to you. So that means that the allowed reimbursement amount is approximately, well, shown here is $8,497,800. So the sources of paying for this amount, as I mentioned, 6.7 million will be added to the tax rate. Uh, about 1.2 million will come from the non-exempt capital project. We discussed that under Article 57 and I mentioned it a few minutes ago. Approximately, we're anticipating somewhere in the order of $3 million from the disposition of the Parmenter and Crosby assets that's subject to uh, negotiation, is subject to your vote and other articles here in town meeting. 
The school um, capital balances, that's the $800,000 that we've previously voted and have set aside for use of the Thompson School. The uh, $20,000 is the interest amount that I mentioned uh, from the Jackie Harrington article of many years ago. And then the MSBA participation of $8,497,000. So that leaves us with $20 million plus a small surplus of $249,446. And um, that's, that surplus is, uh, you know, in, the, in this multi-year drawn out progress uh, project is essentially a, you know, a comma on the accounts and can easily be um, absorbed by small changes in the anticipated interest rates. So uh, basically that, res that reserve is appropriate and if anything, it might be a little bit short. The next uh, slide in your uh, package on page 10 describes the incremental tax impact. And this is based on data that was generated by the treasurer's office and by uh, the town's uh, investment uh, banker, First Southwest. In, in, um, on the, in the top left-hand corner of this uh, uh, page, there's a table that shows the funding source. These are the numbers that we just went through a second ago and where they come from. And as you can see, the singular number that's going to hit the tax rate is that $6.7 million. And the average incremental uh, household impact based on 15,000 uh, parcels is about $29 a year. The uh, total um, impact of this project um, over 17 years on a typical household is going to be, the total aggregate impact is going to be around $2,000. So uh, the chart that's on the bottom has three lines. The, um, it, I, it's probably not in color in your package, but if you look at the screen, the green line on the top is the, um, I'm sorry, let's, let's say the blue line, the upper blue line is the existing um, non-exempt debt that has been borrowed based on uh, the prior school projects and the Sims project. The red line at the bottom, uh, which is under that $50 bar, is the exempt debt impact per parcel of the Thompson project, which on the average is going to be about $30, as I mentioned a couple of seconds ago. And then the green line, if you look at this slide behind me, the green line on the top is the per parcel uh, total amount. And you can see that this uh, exempt debt rolls off, gets smaller and smaller over time as the debt service pays off the outstanding debt. And the reason why it falls off s sort of sharply in a couple of places is because some of the earlier school projects that were started back in the early 2000s or in the 1998 period are being paid off and uh, no longer require debt payments. The next slide um, is a sheet that I uh, put together called Fact Sheet, uh, Fre Frequently Asked Questions. So um, Jeff actually asked the f this question, what happens if the project uh, overruns beyond the reserves that we've shown you, which is a million dollars reserve inside the project and the $250,000 of financing reserve? Well, uh, if it overruns the project, it will likely impact the non-exempt capital budget. That means that some of the things that are in that five-year plan that we have projected in the future would have to be postponed. In any event, whatever happens, it will require approval from town meeting. <coughs> Another question might be, what happens if Parmenter and Crosby are not leased out or sold as forecast? Perhaps town meeting uh, won't allow it. Perhaps a town meeting votes for it and um, the Board of Selectmen and the town manager can't achieve the, the, uh, the ideal uh, transaction that people are looking for. Well then again, this is gonna impact the non-exempt capital budget. We'll likely delay other planned projects like maybe the fire station or the, the um, community safety building. Um, or it actually might overflow the capital budget and impact the operating budget. And then the final question, um, what happens if the MSBA does not approve the schematics in July? And keep in mind, when you vote on this project, if you vote in favor, you've authorized the town to spend that $20 million. So what happens if the MSBA 
doesn't approve it and we don't get any reimbursement. Uh, my observation then is that it's, it's unlikely that the treasurer and the board of selectmen would authorize the bonds. We hope it, I say it's unlikely with a great deal of confidence. I can't predict what the board of selectmen or the treasurer would do, but I don't believe that they would undertake a $20 million project that the town uh, didn't have the reasonable means to pay for. So um, there probably are other important questions, but those are the three I think that loomed most heavily in, in our minds when we were thinking about how to finance this project. So on page 10, there's a little summary here just to remind you of where we were 10 years ago. The town voted $34.5 million to be excluded uh, with, with reimbursement for the repair, the renovation, or the rebuilding of the Pierce, the Dallin, the Stratton, and the Thompson. The MSBA declined to finance the rebuilding of the Stratton, so the town has undertaken to improve that infrastructure on its own. You, the town meeting, have been voting those funds for the last two town meetings, and you voted it again tonight under Article 57. The Pierce and the Dallin have been completed. That leaves the Thompson. The town voted by a 72% to 28% majority to support the rebuilding of these schools. I think today um, it's appropriate and I ask that the town meeting support the will of the Arlington taxpayers and vote to, to rebuild the Thompson. The, the, the Thompson School Building Committee has described to you the school and the plan. The Capital Planning Committee has just described to you the way that this can be funded. So we respectfully ask for your favorable vote on Article 5 for the support of the $20 million project that's described in the report of the Finance Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that in your presentation? Yeah, okay. Mr. Leonard? Sir? Oh yeah, you can't hang your sign over the edge there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leonard, you were first in the list. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. I wonder if somebody could answer a question for me. In the Warren article itself, I mean, I know everybody in the hall knows that we're rebuilt, rebuilding the Thompson. And in the Warren article itself, it's calling for remodel, renovate, construct, construct an addition to, et cetera. Does the Warren article have to be worded that particular way? I mean, where everybody knows we're rebuilding the school, why wouldn't the Warren article just say rebuild? Mr. Foskett, can you answer this question? Yes. Um, th that language was specifically... Uh, provided by the MSBA to the uh, town council, and um, you know, it's, if 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 we're going to get the reimbursement, that's the way we have to word the article. Does the wording of it, and this is I know a reach, but does the wording of it also allow for us to salvage anything if there is anything out of the Thompson School to be salvaged? You mean like sell well, the old stuff? No, I'm just counting? basically saying I'm wondering if there's something there that possibly can be kept to go along with the new building itself. Or is basically just saying everything in the school has got to go? Well, the project that I think uh, Mr. Thielman explained that uh, the project design that we've gone through for the past um, 18 months or so has been under the close supervision of the MSBA and our project manager and architect. So anything that is of value and usable uh, for the next 50 years, I think, has been incorporated into the plan. And I, I don't know, Jeff, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, Mr. Thielman, can you help him out? I, um, we looked at a number of different plans, John. And what made the most sense was to knock the building down and start over. 
I can, if you want, I can, if John, if the moderator wants, I can bring up the architect or the owner's project manager and answer more specific questions. Do you want? I, I think he's, as opposed to the building itself, are you referring to the well, it's, stuff we, inside of it, the books? Any, the anything spirit? at all, Mr. Moderator, from soup to nuts, air conditioning, anything at all that possibly could be salvaged. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we're going to. Sir? Yeah, Charlie can answer. At, at that level, I think the demolition contract will allow us to retain things of value. Okay. One other question, Mr. Foskett, if I could. Is there any way that you could take a minute or two to elaborate that on anybody that is involved with this project, whether it be the design people, the construction people, anybody that would cause a delay Let's say, here we are as Arlington people turning around and giving our okay, but not everything is in our hands. If we find out that somebody is delaying the project due to one thing or another, can you basically tell us how we can keep their feet to the fire? Is there any kind of fines or penalties that they would be under to keep this project moving? Well, I, I think I, uh, should, that, that actually should be answered by the Thompson School Building Committee. We have an architect that is um, responsible for that as well as the, what's called the owner's project manager. And I don't know if uh, you'd like to make a comment, Mr. Nigro. Name and address for the record, please, sir. Uh, my name is Kevin Nigro. My address is 41 Biscayne Avenue in Saugus, Massachusetts. I am the um, owner's project manager. I work for a company called PMA Consultants. Um, as I understand the question, I think the easiest way to answer it is the architect, the OPM, my firm, were required to sign standard MSBA contracts that all OPMs and architects throughout the Commonwealth that do school jobs are required to sign. We have liabilities, insurance, and we have defined roles and responsibilities that must be met. We are measured by MSBA as well as the town administration and school administration. We report monthly to the town and monthly to the MSBA. Um, and the MSBA also has a strict requirements list of checks and balances along the way. Um, we're, we're required to provide them updates, for example, on the feasibility through the schematic, through the design development, to when we hire the contractor. We have to meet their requirements all along the way. And uh, the recourse is through our contracts and our liability insurances. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Malone. My name is Marie Elena Maloney, alias Meg, uh, Precinct 1. Um, Sean Garbley would have liked to have been here tonight, but he is um, in New Bedford this evening at a redistricting meeting um, for the state, that is, not for the town. Um, I would now like to introduce Jane Biondi, who is the Thompson PTO president and will be representing families of the Thompson. Ms. Biondi is allowed, allowed to speak as she's a town resident. Name and address for the record, please, Ms. Biondi. My name is Jane Biondi, and I live at 50 Wyman Street in Precinct 7. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, Mr. Moderator. Why don't you use one of the other mics? That one's not working. Yeah. Jane. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> My name is Jane Biondi. I live at 50 Wyman Street in Precinct 7. I speak to you tonight as the parent of a fourth grader at the Thompson and a sixth grader at the Otteson. I ask you to support Article 5 and to fund the Thompson School Rebuild because it's the right thing to do for Thompson students, the East Arlington community, and the town of Arlington as a whole. I send my daughter to school every day in a building without adequate fire safety systems, with a seriously compromised roof with failing heating and electrical systems. I was interested in what the gentleman in the back said about reclaiming the air conditioning, because there's no air conditioning. The children at Thompson dress, um, they don't dress for the outside weather, they dress for the unique internal weather at Thompson, where it's roasting hot in January and utterly unbearable in June. I once brought in several large fans for my son's fourth grade classroom. His sweating teacher was very happy 
And although the fans cooled the room off a little bit, the teacher then had to compete with the noise of all the fans, struggling to teach above the racket. It was just an unacceptable learning environment. Now, given that my fourth grade daughter will never attend a new Thompson school, someone recently asked me why I was advocating for a new building. I advocate for a new Thompson building because I respect the hard work and dedication of Thompson teachers and staff. Those teachers can work around the shabby and tired conditions of the current building but cannot implement best teaching practices in a substandard building. I advocate on their behalf because I see firsthand their tremendous efforts, their patience, and dedication to some of the most academically needy students in Arlington. I advocate for the parent community that has worked for so many years with town and state officials to realize a new building. A parent community that was promised a new building so many years ago. I laugh now when I think back about my sixth grade son entering Thompson in kindergarten. I believed he'd be in a new building long before he hit fifth grade, but that didn't happen. Over and over again, the town has come close to rebuilding the Thompson, and over and over again, that process has stalled. But I'm here tonight mostly to advocate for the children at Thompson. A school is not just a building. It's a tangible representation of our commitment to our children. I ask you to keep the promises made to all the children of Arlington to educate them in safe and educationally appropriate schools. The Thompson community is uniquely and richly diverse. But that very diversity sometimes complicates education for many of our children. And the current building is failing to meet the educational needs of that diverse population. As the PTO president at Thompson, I know that the school building serves its community far beyond the hours of 8 a.m. to 2.15. For many of our students, the Thompson is the sole source of out-of-classroom learning and enrichment. Our students rely on Thompson to experience drama, art, and science activities to which they would otherwise have no access. Right now, they do that in barely adequate facilities. I also advocate as an Arlington parent. Arlington is a small town. We may have seven elementary communities, but families across town are connected through preschool and soccer and hockey church and the children's theater and all the many hours we've spent on parks and playgrounds. And when our children get to the Odyssey, like my sixth grade son, and then to Arlington High School, they are no longer Dallin or Pierce or Thompson students. They are Arlington students. And as such, they all deserve comparable elementary school experiences both on the fundamental principle of equity and to support their shared futures. We must teach our children through our actions that we as a town honor them all by educating them equally. I fear that a no vote on Article 5 tonight will have the following consequences. The Thompson will remain open next year and indefinitely. My daughter will spend her fifth grade year in a failing and perhaps dangerous building. It's that lack of fire safety that keeps me up at night. The town will be forced to pump greater and greater amounts of money into a failing building. The Thompson rebuild process will come to a halt, sending a message to the Thompson community and the state that the town is not committed to building a new Thompson. Some say we can't afford to rebuild the Thompson, but I think Mr. Foskett has shown us tonight how we can keep the town's promise, its longstanding commitment to all the children of Arlington. So, if you believe that Thompson students deserve a safe school that serves their educational needs, then vote yes tonight, or maybe Wednesday night, <laughs> but I hope tonight. 
If you believe that rebuilding all our schools benefits all Arlington students, then vote yes. And if you have a vision of our town where there is a shared commitment to educate, to high standards, and to educate equitably, then vote yes. The time to rebuild the Thompson School is now. Please vote yes tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Piandi. <laughs> Mr. Liggett has the floor. Please. Please, Mr. Liggett. Um, sir, in the back of the hall in the yellow sweater. Shh, back of the hall in the yellow sweater. Quiet, please. You don't have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Liggett, Precinct 9. I'm speaking to you tonight from two perspectives, that of a town meeting member and that of a concerned parent in the Thompson community. I'll begin from the parent perspective, which leads directly to becoming a town meeting member. My daughter is near the end of the first grade at the Thompson, and my son will be entering kindergarten in the fall of 2012. When I mentioned to Annie, my daughter, recently that I was hoping that Thompson would be rebuilt, she was horrified. What do you mean, rebuilt? Daddy, I love my school. It was bedtime, so I quickly changed the subject, but her words have been on my mind for weeks. I love my school. Does she love the fact that all the major building systems are in need of being replaced? That it's so hot in the rooms that she's sweating and struggling to keep her eyes open during class, that there is no sprinkler or fire system, as Jane alluded, to keep her and the other kids safe? Of course not. Those are the things, those are the things that the grown-ups worry about. What she loves, from her perspective as, as an innocent child, <clears throat> excuse me, is her teachers, her friends, the rich, diverse community, the international festival, the science fair, participating in the Thompson Drama Project, all the great things that go on at that school building that happens to be run down and worn out. As the grown-up, I will be voting yes to support Article 5 to take all of that away from her for the next two years. I worry about that old school, the worn out building systems that could fail at any time and cost a lot to repair. I understand that trying to work in hot, stuffy rooms undermines the tireless efforts of the teachers and prevents our kids from getting the most out of their time at school. I fear for her safety and that of all the kids in the building if there were a fire. I ask you to vote yes as well. If this article passes and the Thompson is rebuilt as planned, it will be difficult and inconvenient in the short term. For my family, for every other Thompson family, and for all of the families across the town and the affected host, um, affected by the host schools that will be absorbing the Thompson students. It is quite likely that my two kids will end up at different schools during the rebuild, as, as would many other families. <clears throat> That will be hard on everyone, physically getting kids to and from different schools, trying to become engaged members of different communities, juggling schedules and logistics for multiple PTOs and school events, the list goes on. But even though it will be hard in the short term, it's the right thing to do for the long term. That's why we're the grown-ups. We're thinking about the long term, balancing the pros and cons, making the hard choices, doing what is right for the Thompson and Arlington communities. And that's how I ended up speaking to you tonight. No offense to anyone here, but becoming a town meeting member was not on my list of life goals. <laughs> I've been a homeowner here in Arlington for 17 years, and I've voted in many town elections without being deeply involved or honestly, totally informed in all cases. The challenges facing the town right now, the Thompson rebuild being but one of the many, are significant enough that I ran as a write-in candidate this spring so that I can be part of trying to meet those challenges. Now that I am a town meeting member, here are four additional reasons why I support Article, F Article 5. First, the plans for the rebuilt Thompson are reasonable. We're not talking about a state-of-the-art showpiece. 
We're not talking about a new car with all of the bells and whistles. We're not talking about a Newton North. <laughs> In reality, we're talking about a reliable, safe, serviceable school that will help the children in our community get an education rather than staying in a building that impedes that education. To go back to the car analogy, we're driving a rundown jalopy right now, hoping none of the critical systems fail. A yes vote on this article takes us one step closer to replacing that jalopy with a good middle of the road car that has the standard features one expects today without the frills that we can't afford and don't need. Second, there's the question of equity and fairness. The reality of the Thompson, as stated tonight, is that it is the most diverse student body of any school in Arlington. With that diversity come enormous opportunities, benefits, and richness, part of what makes the Thompson community so vibrant and fulfilling. Bless, Bless you. Also with that diversity come challenges and responsibilities. We owe it to the children at the Thompson, all of them, to provide the infrastructure needed to support that education. Some of the challenges faced by members of this community are difficult to address, but providing a school facility that is equitable with the others in this town isn't one of them. It's easy to talk the talk about equity and fairness, but we have an obligation to walk the walk. Third, it's now or never. Many people have been working with the MSBA for several years to get this rebuild to actually happen. We're at the, we are at the front of the line, and even with the tough economic climate, we're about to receive eight and a half million dollars to help fund this rebuild. If we don't follow through and approve this article now, we lose MSBA support. We go back to the end of the line. I'm not sure if the town of Arlington could recover from the credibility hit of such a move. I am sure I don't want to try to keep that jalopy running long enough to find out. Fourth, we made a commitment and it's time to fulfill it. Starting in 93 with the school facilities master plan, followed by town-wide referenda in 98 and 2000, we have committed to rebuilding or renovating all seven of the elementary schools. We did five of them in the five years after the 2000 referendum, but have stalled since then. Six years later, it's time to deliver on the next step in that commitment. As I said earlier, I never expected to be up here speaking to you. It turns out some things are worth doing, which is why I'm here. Rebuilding the Thompson is worth doing too. I urge you to join me in voting yes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ms. Phelps, Ms. Phelps. Judith Phelps, Precinct 16, I have a question. We have heard that the students are going to be moved to Stratton and to Hardy and possibly to Bishop. What is going to happen with the kitchen, though, that supplies the lunches for all of the public, uh, the elementary schools in Arlington? Judy? Uh, Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, for the next two years, we will have a temporary central kitchen at the high school. The elementary schools right now have only warming kitchens, so the food will be distributed from the high school. Is there sufficient room at the high school to have this brought in there? On a temporary basis, we'll make it work. We won't keep the, the same level of supplies that we have been, we'll be having to um, order more frequently. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but I've, I've worked with uh, uh, Denise Bousset, who's our, who's our Director of uh, Food Services, and she has thought about it very carefully and has a plan for how this is going to work. Okay, our food service program has always been a very good program here in Arlington, which has kept expenses down for food for our children and made sure that our children got nutritious meals. So I'd hate to see anything happen that that is lost or has to be sent out to an outsider no. to come in during the reconstruction. We're not, sending, we're not sending it out, but we're keeping it in district. And that's actually one of the reasons why we uh, also committed to the central kitchen. 
long time ago in Arlington started this reconstruction process, it's very clear that the commitment in those early schools was to having a central kitchen so that would be uh, closer controls of costs, um, food inspection, and that's what we're fulfilling here also in this, uh, this project. Thank you, Dr. Pody. Thank you, Ms. Phelps. Uh, Mr. Kleinman? Thank you, Mr. Murray. Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1, former Thompson parent who started my son on the road to independence. He's so independent, he now lives in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, um, I want to thank the folks that worked on this plan, because I think this is a terrific plan, and it was a lot of hard work, and, um, and I commend you for it. With that, I have a couple of questions. One is, um, was there a land study that was done so that we make sure that there isn't any pollution or any problems in building? Was there a site plan done, 21E environmental? We currently have a um, geotechnical expert lined up to do that site investigation. Uh, it is on hold until MCAS testing is over, and then we'll conduct the uh, site borings to confirm what we already think, that there is no problem there. We used historical town records uh, to substantiate that, but we are doing the site investigation. So you don't anticipate any problem? No, the typical, okay. um, as in any school in Massachusetts of that age, some uh, lighting issues, some asbestos floor tiles, things like that, that'll be abated before demolition. All right, thanks. The other question is, um, there was a mention about labor costs. Yes. Um, and the labor costs, would they be subject to Davis-Bacon, the Davis-Bacon Act? What that means is that if it's a non-union labor, that, they, that the, they would be paid the lowest union rate. Um, so if anybody we hire, mm -hmm. Um, are we paying, would we be paying them at that rate? Uh, I understand the question that I, I believe Davis Bacon is uh, only involved if there's federal reimbursement funds. We're under the prevailing wage act in Massachusetts, as is any other town project. We have to pay um, per that schedule, part of that schedule that you see in your handout. The state, what we'll do is when the time is right, when we get closer to construction, we will apply to the state labor and industry tell them we're building a school and they'll issue us a rate sheet that says what the minimum wage that we will pay each trade on that job is. And then we will collect certified payrolls from all the individual contractors to make sure that they comply. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, and I strongly suggest that we vote in favor. Thank you. Mr. Marr. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor of terminating the debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. In my opinion, it is a two-third vote. We have now before us the recommended vote of the in the cap of Article Five, of the capital budget, um, to bond to rebuild the Thompson School. Twenty million dollars. This does involve bonding. All in favor of doing so, please say yes. Yes. Opposed say no. It is a unanimous vote and I so declare. <laughs> Hold on. Shh. Oh, please, quiet. Ms. Lucarelli, do you certify 85 town meeting members are present and voting? Yes. yes, okay, thank you. Mr. Tosti, you gonna dissolve the meeting? I just said the. In the FinCom. Yeah. Yes. That's all. It's all the business in front of the, for the special. Okay, fellow town meeting members, uh, having completed all business under the special town meeting, I move that the special town meeting be dissolved. All in favor of dissolving the special town meeting, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? The town meeting is, special town meeting is so dissolved. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I move that Articles 24 through 56, with the exceptions of 31, 34, and 35, be taken from the table. All in favor? All right. All opposed? All those articles are back. Um, was there a further plan for doing 38 and 9 tonight? Okay. Because now we're going to go finish Article 24. We are in the middle of it. This was. Mr. Loretti has a proposed substitute for a resolution on town records. The next person to speak was. Mr. Sandrelli. Is Mr. Sandrelli still here? Uh, nope. Uh, Miss Sreuter? Snyder. Jill Snyder? Is Jill here? Orange, yeah. She used to have an orange jacket on. <laughs> um, Jill Snyder, Precinct 6. Um, I just want to point out, first of all, that there's um, a common misspelling of the word public under um, where, the seventh whereas. It says, uh, whereas the town is committed to providing public records at the lowest possible cost and whenever possible to waiving the fees for that word, I don't want to say. Well, we'll just make that just administrative add an L. change. We'll be good. <laughs> okay. Oh. So I just, that's one thing. Um, a couple of things. Um, first off, I just want to start by saying that I am. I am an archives and records management professional kind of in my life outside of town meetings. So my comments today come from that. And I don't want to come across as being some preacher for records management. So in advance, I'm sorry. Um, but a couple of things I have to, to say about this. Um, I guess in all government, in all state, local, and federal government, there are laws in place that obviously state that we have a legal, that said government has a legal responsibility to provide access to records that are requested by citizens. Um, and in the spirit of sort of open government and transparency, I think we should continue to do so, keeping in mind that um, Mr. Loretti had, did note here that there are certain exemptions, of course, in times in which we will not supply um, access um, to those records. And those things usually relate to things like privacy and, and um, sort of things involved in litigation. Um, so again, I just, that's sort of one thing, um, and this is very true, and this is very apparent, the Freedom of Information Act and the federal level, as well as the Massachusetts Public Records Law in Massachusetts. We sort of, we do records management for three reasons, and I, I'll get to the third reason, which really relates to what I'm talking about now, but the first reason, obviously, is so that people in government can have the records and information they need to do their jobs, so they can get access to the information they need to sort of provide services to you as citizens of Arlington. The second major reason that one would sort of organize and manage and maintain the records would be to, um, in times of disaster, or disaster planning purposes, to identify what records you need during and following a disaster to get back up and running, to get your government back up and running, um, to continue to provide those services again to you. And the third reason is this reason what we're talking about today, is that again, in all government, they have a legal responsibility to provide access to those records to citizens who request it. And this is, this is something that, I guess, um, this is one of those ideas that, again, this is one of the major selling points of why we manage organization, why we manage and maintain records and information in government and in the corporate world as well, is that we do have a legal responsibility to provide access to that information to people who request it. Um, and in sort of in accordance with, um, it, you would manage that information in records uh, in a record keeping system, whether it be paper or electronic, and that um, it, we, you would do so according to a file plan that's based on, and our, on our purposes, uh, based on uh, the Massachusetts rec Records Retention Schedule. Um, partly it's been brought up, there were some concerns the other day that were mentioned about things like people providing, um, people requesting things like databases and they, they, people weren't able to easily access the database because it was based on an old technology. And those are places where, again, I feel like it's really important that we that we have a migration strategy for those types of those records and information so we can provide access to them. Because at the end of the day, those are headaches that we're going to have to continue to deal with forever. 
Um, but that's really important, again, that we continue to maintain and manage the records and information. And I'm going to get to sort of my point now. There are, <laughs> there are sort of two major cases or times in which someone would request records to the town, right? So one is, many of you mentioned it the other day, sort of simple people said, I want access to some type of records information. It's kind of a citizen in Arlington comes forward and says, I want access to this information. Um, and it should be a quick win for the town. Again, if the record keeping practices are good and, and so, sort of simple, this should be a quick win for the town. They should be able to easily give you access to that information. There are other circumstances, of course, maybe in times like if there's some kind of litigation that's going on and there's a major discovery that comes out as a result and the, someone says, I'm going to sue the town of Arlington, which never happens, right? But someone comes and says, I'm going to sue Arlington and I want access to all the records relating to a particular topic. And that, that can be very, very uh, expensive and it can also be very time consuming. And again, these are two very unique situations and I know some of the concerns were that I was hearing from people the other day were things like, you know, they're kind of treating all those situations in the same manner. So, and there are actually some corporations in the corporate world that have actually had rather settle um, because it's cheaper to settle and accept defeat than actually go and try to maintain and manage the record. So enough of my rambling on and my preaching about how records management is so important. I, I think I just, I'm just basically coming up to say that I do rise uh, in support of this. I um, mean, I think it's a, it's a really great um, because it just sort of does basic things like, you know, we need to establish, we need to establish uh, sort of fees and we all need to know what they are and we should provide training to people and we should make sure that, that, um, that the people who are the lowest, sort of be being paid the lowest, are the ones actually doing the work. So um, I guess that's it. So that's, please vote in favor of um, Mr. Loretti's substitute motion. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. To pass. Mr. Deist. John Deist, precinct. Is that okay? No. John Deist, precinct 13, and a member of the Finance Committee. Uh, as I recall, a, a, a quote of a cost per hour was made last week and I think the number was $32 an hour for uh, someone to search records, someone knowledgeable in the town presumably to search records. I wonder if anybody's thought about what it costs you to simply get your car repaired nowadays. It's up around 50 bucks an hour or something like that. So $32 an hour is a bargain for somebody who is knowledgeable about records. And I guess I also want to point out that too much of this can get to be a terribly slippery slope. Um, I'm an engineer. There are enormous amounts of information, uh, some of it very valuable, that's published hard copy, uh, created over many, many years, uh, all of it in, on bookshelves and things like that. If I have to go back and look for one of those things, I go to the shelves and I look for it. I don't expect it to be in electronic form nowadays because there's way too much to ever turn into electric form, uh, into uh, information technology as we view it today for modern kinds of publications. So uh, much of what Mr. Loretti says here is reasonable, but the process has to be kept within reason as well. We all know how tight the budgets are. Uh, to do some of the kinds of things that are implied here might be terribly expensive. So I think that the manager and the town and the school should try to comply with some of these things, but certainly it get, can get to be a terrible burden if we're not careful and you use good judgment to do it well. Thank you very much. Mr. Loretti for a second time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Crystal Reddy, uh, Precinct 7. Um, just a, a few comments, and I'd, I'd like to address a few of the statements that were made um, last week. Um, I would stand behind what I said last week, and I can do that because I have the records to document what I said. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, I think it's important that everyone realize what the different types of, of records requests are. If you walk into the selectman's um, 
office and ask for a copy of the agenda for that evening's meeting. That's a public records request. If you ask them for copies of the warrant articles that were submitted the day after the warrant closes, that, that's a public records request. And similarly, if you go into the clerk's office and ask to see the campaign finance reports of the selectmen, that, that also is a public records request. Uh, I've made dozens of such requests over the years, and I'm assuming probably a lot of you have also. And, and most of the time, there is no problem doing that. But, but on the rare occasions, there are, and, and that's why I submitted this, this article. Um, I believe last week the town manager said I, made, I had appealed a number of uh, responses to my public records request, and in fact, um, that number is exactly two. And he also said all of them were denied. Well, one of them was. Um, but the other one was the one I spoke of, and in that case, I appealed based on the, the fees that were uh, asked, to, that I was asked to pay, pay. And through the intervention of the supervisor of records, that fee was reduced from an estimate of $1,000 to $1,500 to an amount of $200, and I considered that reasonable and um, agreed to pay that amount, so the check in a couple weeks ago, and at, at this point, I'm waiting to get the record. So I consider that a success, even though the town manager you know, referred to it as a denial. And that's the beauty of, of the public records law. You, know, you, can, um, you don't have to listen to how the town manager or other town officials spin information. You don't have to listen to how I spin it. You can request the document yourself, and you can read it, and you can spin it any, any which way you want. And that, that is, is really important. I would point out, um, you know, the information that is produced to public records requests, of course, isn't always um, the things the town wants to hear. When the million and a half dollar um, budget over um, spending of the school department was made known last fall publicly, that was the result of a public records request by Stephen Harrington. And, and I think, you know, while as much as we don't want to hear that information, we also want to be sure it's available to the public when people request it. So I'd just like to close by saying I think some of the selectmen have suggested that I have a, a personal agenda or, um, in putting forth this resolution. And I want to assure you and everyone else that that is absolutely correct. And I want to tell you what that agenda is. <laughs> you know, my agenda is that all town employees who handle a records requests, regardless of which department they're in, um, have an understanding of the public records law so that they may act in, in accordance with the letter and the spirit of the law. And I also want public records requests to be handled consistently uh, without regard to what types of records are being requested uh, or, or who is making those requests. So that's my agenda, and I hope it's your agenda, and I hope you'll support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovetti. Mr. Fitzgerald. Tom Fitzgerald, Precinct 11. With all due respect to some of the proponents of this, as a taxpayer, I want access to my records, but I don't want the, the few employees we have left in this town spending their time on re ad nauseum requests for, for things from the same people. It, se it seems like that is what... Uh, is causing the problems. I want the town to charge an amount that will more than cover the request, but also be reasonable, um, because we can't afford to spend our uh, employees' time on whether there's agendas or not. I don't want my taxpayer dollars to be spent on someone's personal agendas. Mr. Hainer. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. Uh, I just recommend uh, to all the boards and everything to put all this stuff on as soon as possible and economically, electronically, and let people just access them through the internet. Uh, they should be public records only. Uh, Things that should be held confidential wouldn't be on that, but it won't cost anybody anything once this is done. Can't happen tonight or overnight, but in the future. Take advantage of it and go forward with this. Thank you. Mr. Fisher for a second time. Uh, 
uh, Andrew Fisher, uh, Precinct 6. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, there is a pickle here between devoting a lot of town money to digging up information that doesn't particularly help uh, to run the town. At the same time, we, we strive for transparency, and we can't let that mean transparency only for, uh, for those who can afford it. Um, and I know the town manager's office and other offices are, are often bombarded with demands. Um, but if the uh, two things, one is uh, if this resolution does fail, I would hope that the selectmen would uh, develop a, a policy if there isn't already one that uh, helps advise the, the manager how to, how to deal with this, because it is a pickle. Um, and the second thing is uh, it, how it's handled speaks kind of to the atmosphere of the town. Um, the request I made regarding information uh, about the um, contract with the Mass Municipal Association Insurance Program, the response could have been well, you, you have to pay for X, Y, Z. If you'd like to simply see the contract, you could come in and sit down and read the contract. Uh, that kind of nature of thing. Um, so that, that's basically uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, I hope you'll vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Berger? You want the list? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Berger, uh, Precinct 6. I uh, support Mr. Lurie's um, Article 24, and I, I urge you to support it. Um, in, in responding last week uh, to Mr. Loretti, uh, Mr. Sullivan uh, indicated that he takes it very seriously, as, is, as does the town, the Mass Public Records Law. And I was glad to hear that, but I want you to know from my own experience, I've had some uh, troubling experiences trying to get information in a timely manner, according to the, uh, the law. I have to remind folks that might think the town has an option. They have a responsibility to meet the letter and spirit of the law. There's a mass public records law, as Mr. Loretti has said. For example, you know, I've requested a lot of uh, information at different times regarding the Mass Avenue Carter Project uh, through freedom of information request for documents to, uh, to find out certain things. And I've, I've requested them through my attorney. And I want to give you a couple of examples of where Mr. Loretti's uh, article is correct in, in making sure that all town employees are trained and know the specifics of the law. For example, on February 26th, a letter from my attorney uh, went to Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Kowalski requesting certain information. Now the state indicates that you have 10 days to respond as a maximum, maximum. And uh, I didn't get a response, my attorney didn't for 19 days, 19 days. Now that's a, that breaks the law, 10 days is the, is the thing. On June 23rd, uh, we sent a letter, my attorney did, to, uh, to uh, Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Kowalski and we got a response, he got a response on July 13th, 19 days later. On June 8th, I made a request through my attorney, and on June 23rd, 13 days later, better than 19, but three past 10, we got a response that indicated the costs. That's, that's according to the law, that's perfectly legitimate. They indicated there's a cost involved, and they cited the costs, okay? Now, on June 29th, my attorney, under my advisement, sent a check to the town for the amount of the documents. The costs were reasonable. Now it's July 29th, 30 days later. I called my attorney. I said, D have you gotten anything? I didn't get anything. He sends a letter on July 29th. Uh, to Ms. Rice, to Ms. Rice, who Ms. Rice has been responsive, by the way. 
she knows the law and, and she's met it as far as my dealings with her. Anyway, he sends a letter to Ms. Rice on July 29th. He brings up three, three matters and one of them, he says, is we don't have any documents. You know, it's been a month. A month. We sent the check a month ago. I mean, that shouldn't be. That should not be. So, so what uh, Mr. Loretti is saying here is, uh, you know, that the training is important, that the spirit and letter of the law have to be carried out, and that the tone, I'm not, Mr. Sullivan says the tone is there. Well, the tone has to be uh, ratcheted up a little bit so that all employees know they have a responsibility to meet the public. They are being paid. Well, Chief here? Yes. Okay. Chief's got it. Keep going. Okay. Thank you. Uh, they're, being, they're being paid by the public. You know, I was in public ed. I served as an administrator for about 29 years, different uh, levels, principals, and so on. And I worked for one great superintendent. And the superintendent reminded us every year that we were public employees serving the public, paid for by the public and we were to respond. And he didn't want us ever to go home with a message on our desk that a parent called and we didn't respond. So it's that kind of tone that I urge you to support. Uh, Article 24, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's looking good over there. Ms. Friedman? Cindy Friedman here tonight? Nope, okay. Um, Mr. Judd, you are next. Do you want to take time from your watching duties? Ms. Broadman, oh, you going to talk, Mr. Judd? Yes, sir. Pardon the interruption. Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. You have just heard from Mr. Berger that occasionally there can be bureaucratic obfuscation meaning no response. We have to remember that the government serves us, not the other way around. We want transparency in everything, especially oh, when certain people were president, we wanted everything to be transparent. I do not like the idea that even if somebody is a professional gadfly, such as myself, would be turned down for any kind of a public record because of the fact that nobody likes him. Or, on the other hand, that a fee or charge would be so high as to make it economically very difficult for somebody who is not, shall we say, financially able, like somebody who's retired and on Social Security. So I think any time that you're trying to, uh, shall we say, put a price on something, I think you heard earlier that the fact that at least a person should be able to come in and see the document. Then if there's going to be a charge for making copies, it should be a reasonable charge. For instance, the comment in the uh, warrant article which we are supposed to, uh, which the recommend recommendation of the selectman was no action said something about a $50 fee for each item requested. And I think that's getting pretty outrageous. I mean, we want to, I mean, if worse comes to worse, the people in this town are supposed to be served by the government, regardless of their financial situation, or whether they're good guys, bad guys, or just plain reprobate. This is the duty of the government. And I do not want us to have another case where all of a sudden a million and a half dollars doesn't seem to be where it should be. I'm not necessarily saying it was tried to be covered up, but it certainly wasn't being brought out to the open quickly. And I think that was an honest error that was made there. So I'm not accusing anybody of doing anything illegal but I think that there are some times 
when we as town meeting members or officials or anybody who has anything to do with the town might not want everybody to know everything about what we're doing. But I think that the public interest has to come first. And if we end up having to, uh, shall we say, pay somebody extra for it, as we play, pay police officers for detail work, as an example, I think that should be absorbed within the town's budget, no matter how much it may hurt, because it is a public record. And that would include any minutes of a uh, executive session or executive session of whether it's the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, or any committee. Anything that is done in an executive session must be accounted for and recorded, even if it involves personalities, etc. And that, I believe, is the public records law, that we cannot be keeping secrets from the public, whether they're good secrets or bad ones. Let's, let's keep within the scope of the resolution. Well, that is the whole point of the resolution, sir. Not because the no action uh, recommendation by the Board of Selectmen I find to be almost an insult to us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Broadman. Janice Broadman, Prince Sink 15, and just be brief. Um, as many of you know, I work in a lot of countries that don't have the democracy we have here. I think it's absolutely crucial that we, I mean, having access to public records is just ab fundamental. It's not a right that we sell or that we buy. Um, that's the role and responsibility of the local government uh, up to the federal government. And having an, a warrant article that says that the, that the price to the public should be as low as it can reasonably be uh, seems fundamental. It's amazing to me that we're even arguing about this. So I uh, urge you to vote for this. I think it's a essential and very reasonable. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Good. Hi, I'm David Good, and I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about reality uh, when, when uh, we talk about public information. Now, uh, we have uh, talked about public service, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a servant to the public. We've talked about people's rights, and I also have to guide and guard some of those people's rights. So when public records requests come to my desk for uh, email, I have to review what's being asked for, but I have to also review what's being delivered. Because in a request looking for any and all versions or uh, instances of a person's name, you may come up with many different names or many people with the same name. You may come up with people who have uh, medical issues, who are board members, who uh, take care of retirement issues. So you have to protect those people also while you're looking. So it, it takes time to do this. These requests, as, as, as well as being a right of the public, are also a right of the town to make sure we don't violate anybody else's rights. So to be talking about this like it's simple and just press a button and it pops out, absolutely not. I said, because if in fact we have to protect everyone's rights while we're doing this. And there are some frivolous requests. People putting requests in for any and all information about a specific project 11 years ago is out of their mind. A truck is going to back up with paper and dump it in your lap. You want maps of projects from 11 years ago that we probably don't even have a copy machine to, to make copies of. It's, it, you have to be real. The last three requests that, that, that I delivered cost $200, $77, and free. Now, the ones that were in the thousands of dollars were probably because it was any and all since the beginning of time that's blue, red, or green. Now, it, 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 it amazes me that people don't think that there are cycles involved in, in looking at this data. Now, yes, we have some old systems, and I've spent the last couple of years converting them. 
And the Lord knows that we know the sensitivity about email in this town, okay? So I spend a good portion of my time dealing with attorneys about information. It's not fun. And I spend a lot of my own project time and personal time making sure my own people aren't subpoenaed, sequestered, or brought before a judge because I should be the one taking care of them while I do this work. So it's a responsibility for me to defend both my work here and also answer your requests. But in Mr. Loretti's case, he and I chatted for a good amount of time about his original request. And I said, if you can wait till I convert data, because I had an antiquated system and did not have an archiver. I said, if you can wait, the price will be lower. I have 18 to 24 months worth of data to, to convert, 100,000 emails a month. I'm up in the million. Um, and you want, me to rec you want me to search through for specific criteria. He didn't want to wait. He appealed it. So the state records officer said, well, if, if uh, Mr. Good converts the data, your estimate will be cheaper. It wasn't the state records office that said 200 bucks. It was Dave Good, the CTO, after he spent 1,500 bucks of his own time doing the request, and then said $200 is probably fair. So there's nobody looking to make any money here. I think that what we should do is look deeply into trying to understand what we're asking for, get guidance. I understand some of you feel like we're hiding things under the bed, and believe me, we're not. But I do believe I have a right to serve, but I also have a right to protect. And I think in, in, in certain instances, it takes longer. You have to put eyes on things. If there are attorney-client privilege piece of document, Mr. Loretti's request pulled out 4,888 pieces of mail, coupled with about 750 attachments. Do you want to read through those? How long do all of you spend on email? I spent half of my life on email. When I leave here, when I come here, while I sit here. So if you want to go through there looking for specific information about certain people that I shouldn't divulge information to because it's not in the scope of the request, that's a lot of time. So in closing, I would say, I'm here to serve and to do a fair job and to help you get the information you need when it's electronic. But I, I can't support this article because it's not the reality that we live in here at the town. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Good. <clears throat> I have the benefit of seeing through the rear windows. Mr. Marquis appears to be okay. He's got a, one of our EMTs out there chatting with him. Um, next, uh, Mr. McCorry. Uh, Hugh, <coughs> Hugh McCrory, uh, Precinct 20. Um, I think on the face of this article, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I guess I am concerned. Uh, I am concerned that, well, <coughs> first of all, a few questions from the moderator. Um, this is a resolution. Is this a binding resolution or? No, it's so, a, just a resolution. We're asking so, them to play by nice rules. Okay, so it's a, it's a resolution that the town would ask of, uh, I guess, the town manager. Um, and notice in the, in the resolution there's no timeliness either, so it doesn't have to be done next year or the year after or 100 years from now. No, we, we can't order the town manager to do anything. So okay. we're just asking him, the selectman, to okay. consider this and do it. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that there's no uh, limit to the cost to the town in this. In, in, in the in the in the uh, article, Correct. I see nothing about spending. Okay. Um, I just want to bring up a point that I think I believe the town manager made uh, uh, previously when we, we talked. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, certain emails are more difficult to get at than others. Uh, I.e., the older emails are harder to get at. So, does that mean the more recent emails should be? cheaper, and therefore do we need a, a basically a sliding scale of costs depending on the, uh, the age of the, the data? Would that be, uh, oh, that's a suggestion. Um, I think this, this seems like a difficult uh, process for the town, the size of Arlington to implement. I think it's difficult, but I think it will make us stronger as a town. But I don't think we should be, uh, 
we should be deciding it without knowing the cost and uh, the effort, as Mr. Good has mentioned. Um, it would be nice if it was a revenue generator. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but in all seriousness, it, it's, 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 a shun, it's a sunshine article. We, we need this information. So what I would like to see is I would like to see a committee set up And I would like to see it engaged seriously uh, with a time, a timeliness, that something can be put in place. Um, I have another question to the moderator, uh, actually perhaps to the town manager, in fact, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, has anyone availed of the training that uh, has been provided by, by the state? Mr. Sullivan, on, do you have any answer? Public records law. Uh, town council provides the uh, training to uh, all the town officials. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, that's a yes? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I, I find it uh, just a difficult article uh, to support or uh, to vote on if we don't know the cost to the town and the effort. Uh, it needs to be a, bit, a little bit more uh, quantified, so I have not, I'm not uh, urging you to vote either way. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. We'll be back Wednesday night. Thank you.